here. Okay, for people joining this live stream, we are going to do a discussion here today with Norman McGill and Rio Carrero. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to be talking about math formalization, uh, particularly about uh, Norman's long term meta math project and uh, uh, some other aspects of the general question of math formalization. So I, so I have to ask to get started, Norm, the, the, how, did, how did you come to build a, uh, well, what, what do you call MetaMath? Well, it, it's, I think you've described it, let's see, I think I even have, just to prove that I'm, that I'm doing my due diligence, I have a copy of your book about oh, uh, oh, yeah. MetaMath here, I'm which is, okay. um, says, A Computer Language for Mathematical Proofs. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And, uh, so how did so how did this whole thing get started? Well, uh, first of all, well, it, it ultimately it, it went back to my frustration of reading that actually it was all inspired when I saw Principia Mathematica and like hundreds of pages, well, hundreds which, of pages. Of we're, we're talking the Russell Whitehead Principia yes. Mathematica, number two. Okay. Two. Yep. Yes, not yours. No, 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 and not, and not, okay. and not the, the original Newton one. So we're, we're the oh, yes. uh, That's correct. Yeah, yes, the Russell Whiteheads. And, you know, this is actually a PBS Nova program. And it um, said after hundreds of pages, they finally proved one plus one equals two. Right. And it, it's like that, for some reason, just boggled my mind. I mean, how is that even possible? How, how why would it take that? To do that. And, so I know um, I'm curious in MetaMath, how many steps does it take you? Okay. Um, that's, well, for example, the proof of two plus two equals four. Uh, one plus one equals two is not interesting because it's a definition of two. So, um, but um, one of the, let me just explain a little bit about the concept of MetaMath. Um, if you look at a book on formal logic, they have the axioms stated in the form of schemes. Uh, each, you know, you, you take a scheme, you pick one instance of it, and that's a step of your proof. If you work that out, you end up with proofs that are just astronomically large because, you know, every piece of the proof is going to require a different instance of the scheme. So what I looked at was what if you just prove directly from schemes, forget instantiation in the object language. Just, and the problem is the way that schemes are structured in books, there is no way to uh, work directly with them. In propositional calculus, you can sort of, you can do that. It's not a problem. You just pretend that the uh, formula meta variables are you know, primitive variables of the system. But for when you get into predicate logic, it becomes very complex and not, it's just messy. And even so, though people- Just to okay. understand what you mean by schemes versus other things. So I mean, in, yes. in kind of like in the language that we build, you know, we have the notion of patterns. We have literal expressions, mm -hmm. things like, you know, plus of one and one and so on. And we have a pattern that's things like plus of X blank and Y blank, those kinds of things. Right. So by, by scheme, I mean, when, when one talks about, for example, um, the things a little bit are not quite understanding. In, in piano arithmetic, for example, we might have an axiom that says effectively X blank plus Y blank equals Y blank plus X blank, but that's an ordinary axiom. Then we might have an axiom schema that has something that involves, I guess, a higher level object being quantified over. Yeah, actually the... the um... First order um, classical logic that covers everything is nothing but schema. Everything is a schema. So, um, and you know, the schema schemes have different conditions attached. Like, you know, this follows only if this variable is not free for this other variable and this formula meta variable, and it becomes messy to work with. Um, now, if books do derive schemes from other schemes, but they tend to be messy proofs, like they might be derivations based on combining cases or induction on formulae length or something like that. It's not a simple thing. 
So what I looked at is how can we change the system so that we can work directly with schemes in a very simple way. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I, basically that's the concept behind MetaMath. I mean, there are other aspects of MetaMath, which, you know, the details of the language, I don't even consider that important. You know, the language is sort of arcane and weird, but there are other ways of doing languages. It's the concept of working directly with schemes as primitive objects, it, you know, is, makes it dramatically more efficient. Now, <clears throat> you asked about the two plus two equals four proof. Um, mm -hmm. If we work out, okay, the two, two plus two equals four is a little bit more involved than meets the eye because here I'm talking two as a subset, as a, an element of the number of complex numbers. So first of all, we have to construct integers and then rationals and then real numbers, and then complex numbers. So there's a lot to go through to get to two plus two equals four. So that sort of explains the difficulty of the proof. But um, if you Wait, were to why do are this- Why you going outside of integers? But why do you need to go outside of integers to talk about that? Because we wanna have the ability to work with all complex numbers. Okay. We don't have to. Yeah, I can also do two plus two equals four with uh, ordinal numbers, which are the integers, and the proof is much simpler. And we've done that, okay? But it's fun to talk about the, the, the real and, two and plus two equals four that we use it, in actual I, work. Okay. Uh, also, if, if you directly axiomatize, let's say, PO arithmetic, uh, you can do so in MetaMath, and then the proof of two plus two equals four will, in fact, be just two, three lines, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. I see. So, so, okay. But so if you are choosing an axiom system, which you hope will grab a bigger piece of mathematics, then you have to wander around a lot further to get to That's this right. Yeah. Result. These are all derived directly from the axioms of ZF set theory, Sir Mello Frankel set theory. And okay. uh, to get from there to complex numbers is a long journey. So anyway, that's you and, you and Whitehead and Russell both. I mean, they also were trying to use set theory as the foundation. Uh, Yes, in a sense. I mean, Russell's set theory was sort of, um, I don't know, it was, it was kind of more of a type theory. It wasn't that successful, but um, it was the same idea, yes. Um, Zermelo Frankel's set theory came later after Russell. Right. Um, so, so coming back to your notion of schemes, I'm trying to understand, maybe somebody who knows this technical detail can help. I mean, in, in when you write down, and maybe you should actually show something on the screen or something, if that would mm -hmm. be helpful. Um, the, uh, you know, is that something, so in, in our language, for example, we will tend to have a pattern on the left-hand side that defines a transformation to something where the pattern variables have been instantiated, it turns into a specific thing. Uh, you know, it defines a transformation to something specific. Is, is what's happening here, is what you call a scheme something which will be like our uh, something where pattern variables are on both sides? Is that is that what's happening or is it something completely different? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, or I, I, I can handle this, I think. So, yeah. so the, um, so Mathematica has uh, pattern variables that can bind on the right-hand side. And in, in this sense, these, these are exactly schemes. What what makes Metamath a little bit different is that you're working directly with those. You're, you're sort of deriving at the level of those uninstantiated pattern variables. Now, I, I'm not sure to what extent, uh, uh, I mean, you can use, like, you can insert, yeah, well, if you have, you know, F of X underscore Y underscore, you can insert like X and Y. Now you have symbols, X and Y, uh, and then you have to sort of post hoc substitute them after that point. Um, right, so, so the question is what in, happens if you feed in, if you have F of X blank, uh, colon equals, you know, the list x x, and then you feed into f a pattern object like z blank. What does it do? The answer is it says that's fine. Then the answer will be the list z blank z blank. But we don't have particularly well developed pattern transformation, uh, a particularly well developed pattern transformation calculus. That's something that we've been, um, as we think about representing proofs in our language. That's something that we've been kind of led to think about is um, 
uh, is kind of, you know, how would we, what, what are the right primitives? And maybe this is what you're about to tell me from, from Metamath. What are the right primitives for sort of the manipulation of, of patterns, basically? I mean, is that, is, that a, is that a way to think about what you're doing is that it's a story of, of manipulation of patterns? And, and then for us, for example, the pattern, you know, if you say F of X, you could turn that into F blank of X blank. And that's kind of like a, um, you know, quantification over functions. Um, you know, the, the F blank is kind of like a quantification over functions. And, and for us, in sort of our symbolic level, we're not really distinguishing what's, you know, we're only talking about things structurally. We don't have this notion of what order of function the thing is. But so how, is, is that right. a reasonable way to, to think about these things or should I think about it differently? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, whenever you substitute in, in Metamath, you're going to be substituting these pattern variables, these X blanks, you would substitute it for another expression containing more pattern variables. So at every level, you're always, you always have some expression containing lots of pattern variables. Um, and then the other thing that, that makes uh, this uh, interesting is that we have these uh, side conditions like this where X does not occur in phi. Um, now, uh, there is, you know, there's the slash semicolon, slash semicolon thing that you can do right. in, yeah, for, for being able to, to predicate a, uh... Oops, we froze. Did everybody freeze? Or did no, I think um, Mario had uh, mentioned... Uh, if you substitute in... Go ahead. Mario, you might just want to repeat that last sentence. Ah, yeah. um, so... Uh, you have in the in the slash semicolon you can you can predicate a pattern, and uh, the metamath uh, version of this is basically you keep those symbolic. You say, okay, I know that uh, this uh, whenever you apply the scheme, this this side condition it. has to be satisfied. And then when you substitute in more things, that side condition decomposes into more side conditions on the inputs. Right, and that that and I mean the whole algebra is about that. So, okay, that's very interesting. I mean, for us, uh, you know, actually in SMP, the predecessor of, of Wolfram Language and Mathematica had a more elaborate way of dealing with what we called semantic pattern matching. We removed this because it was, you know, undecidability kept on poking its head up in practical things people were doing. And it was, it was incomprehensible, you know, what would take a long time, what would not, and so on. So, what you're what you're describing here is interesting. Is is in a sense a a calculus of slash semicolon, you know, a, a way of of composing slash semicolon conditions, um, where so so in a sense, or, or maybe I should think about it a different way. It's kind of lazy pattern matching, as in you're you're imagining you're building up a symbolic representation of a pattern to be matched, but it is the pattern. It's like for example, one thing we again have actually we use internally, but we don't really expose very well, is pattern unification, right? Where, where you're saying, um, so what, what you're talking about, I see, so what, the way I should think about this is, this is a, a, a way of, so for example, one thing maybe you have, and maybe this is what MetaMath is at some level, is a pattern simplifier. That is, if I've got a pattern that is composed with another pattern that is composed with another pattern, I can ask the question, what is that equivalent to? And that would be, that potentially will need to resolve the slash semicolon conditions and all those kinds of things to know what it's equivalent to. So is that, I mean, am I, uh, you know, we, we've never worked on, to my knowledge, maybe, maybe somebody else here can, can correct me. I don't think we've ever seriously worked on pattern simplification. Um, I mean, we, we have a need in our language. Um, one of the things in sort of language design that's always interesting is what, undecided what things which are undecidable if you step on the wrong in the wrong place can you get away with actually having in the language because nobody will ever step in the wrong place so to speak um and one of those things is um uh we have this notion you know you say f of one equals one f of x blank equals x times f of x minus one or something uh we need to make sure that the f of one is always tried before the f of x blank is tried okay and that requires a bunch of pattern unification algorithms and so on to try and figure out which pattern is more general than which other pattern. And for example, when there are slash semicolon conditions involved, we can't figure that out. We know that's undecidable and hopeless. Um, but perhaps what you're telling me is that this is what you're providing here is in some sense a, 
a, a calculus for trying to figure out those, you know, how to simplify patterns, so to speak. If if I'm so, well, okay. so the the side conditions are are of a very simple form, and this is basically what makes it work. Um, if it, it's true that that for Mathematica, this would really probably, I mean, it, it's certainly undecidable. Like if you if you just stick an arbitrary Boolean predicate depending on anything, of course you won't be able to to solve those. But um, in the case of Metamath, the 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 side conditions are always of the form this uh, basically these two pattern variables have a disjoint set of of let's say object variables. We lost you, unfortunately, Mario. But but I think the what you are of, I don't and quite a variable know. like phi, and you're saying that I don't want the x to occur in phi. So phi well, is a phi is a. a so wait a second. One thing that I don't understand about that, at some point that gets very syntactic. That is, does this occur in that? That's a thing where you've got a literal expression. Yeah. You're asking, does it occur? Does it not occur? But what, at what point do you stop being patterns all the way down and start being something about which you can ask a, a literal question? Or are there pieces of those patterns that have literals which you can ask about? So, so this this is interesting because it, it's it's sort of a, a hybrid of, of both, and it, and it stays that way. So basically, uh, we have this condition where x does not occur in phi, and we think of that semantically as x is not one of the variables that's going to be substituted for phi in the sort of object language. But uh, one of the the unusual things about metamath is there is no actual object language at the bottom. It's always schemes for more schemes. So whenever you substitute into a scheme, you get another scheme, and uh, we the the object language is only really like semantically. It's sort of in our mind of of how we interpret these expressions. So with this, where x does not occur in phi, the syntactic thing that's actually happening is that whenever you substitute in uh, a a expression for phi, you're going to substitute in some expression containing more scheme variables. And now what we say is that, well, if we said that x is not supposed to occur in uh, in this, this expression, what we really mean is that x does not occur in any of the scheme variables appearing in that expression that we have just substituted. So uh, basically, this, where x does not occur in phi variable. turns into a conjunction over yeah. all of the variables inside that scheme. But I don't understand if, if you what is X blank could be any of many X's. So at what point do you know, you know, isn't an X blank and a Y blank aren't X blank and Y blank the same thing? They just happen to have different names, but X blank and Y blank both can stand for any expression. So what would it mean to say in the expression F of X blank? to say y blank is absent from the expression f of x blank. That doesn't make any sense in our, in our way. In other words, I mean, okay, let, let me just say that this question of what a variable is, is a deep question that we keep on getting confronted with. You know, what is a variable algebraically? What is a variable in an axiomatic system? You know, what, when does a variable become something that you can actually sort of uh, talk about syntactically? So what's the answer to that question so, about f of, go ahead. So, so regarding f of x, um, what would happen is, um, uh, the, this is the reason why it's actually a disjoint variable condition and not a, uh, the, like this, this is sort of a, a simplified reading where you say where x does not occur in phi. Uh, what it really means is that where all of the things that are substituted into x do not occur in all of the things that are substituted into phi. Um, so, in the example with y blank does not appear in f blank of x blank, what you would do is you actually substitute at, at least at the the in the object language. So so in in uh, in uh, Mathematica that would be like putting in actual terms for these pattern variables. So if you put in actual terms for these pattern variables, you would put in uh, an actual x for uh, x blank, and then uh, f of x would have something else substituted in for it. Let's say uh, I don't know, x plus x, or, or you know, some lambda that, that eventually mm -hmm. evaluates to x plus x. And then we would be able to say that, ah, that has an x, uh, this time a, an actual symbol x, and this has an x in it too. Um, and so that's a, that's a violation. Okay, but that's fine, but I don't understand. You, I thought you explained that it's patterns all the way down. 
equation of, when do, of when violation. Do I get to... If you substitute in y plus y for the, the f of x, then it would not be a violation. So what we're really talking about is uh, when, you, when you substitute in the actual expressions, but the actual expressions here being still symbolic expressions, right? They, they, they have a, a, an x variable in it. It's just this isn't an x blank anymore. This is just an, an x like it would be in Mathematica. Uh, and those you can actually just check. Or does it occur? In I there? understand. Boy, this is very similar to the the deadly semantic pattern matcher that we had in SMP, which was um, which which was okay. Well, if you've managed to make that work, fantastic. And maybe maybe by restricting the kinds of conditions you can have, you can actually make something that works in practice. Because in SMP, the problem was there were too many landmines too close that you could step on, where where it was really really hard to decide whether these patterns matched. Okay, I think Norm was going to show us some some um, uh, something about how MetaMath is actually set up. Okay. So, yeah. Um, what I have is the screen is showing that I have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I thought maybe it's good to look at what you see in a standard logic textbook. Is mm -hmm. uh, what I show here. Um, basically, there are th these are on top of propositional calculus, which you know, propositional calculus itself is pretty simple. This is predicate calculus. Um, these are what you find in textbooks. You find things that, um, you know, for all x, phi of x implies phi of y, provided that y is free for x in phi of x. Now, that has a pretty complicated meaning. It means you have to yeah. basically peel away the layers, find out what the scope of all the variables, what's bound, what's free, what's free relative to this other one. It's a complicated algorithm. And um, in addition, there are things like the argument X and Y. What does that mean? Um, in fact, it gets even more complicated if you look at uh, STDPC7 here, X equals Y implies phi of X, X, where you have two placeholders implies phi of x, y, provided that y is free for x and phi of x, x. Even trying to grasp what that means is confusing. <laughs> but um, that's what you, that's how textbooks teach it. Now, let's go to the- Oh, wait a second. I just want to understand. What, what does it mean, y is free, provided that y is free? What do you mean by y is free? As in y doesn't contain x or what? Um, what, what does the x. term y is free mean? So y is free for x in phi means that if you substitute all free occurrences of x with y, uh, then you will not cause any bound variable captures. I believe that's roughly oh. what this condition is trying to say. Boy, you know, this whole thing with variables, you know, old, old Moses Schoenfinkel was onto something there. You know, if we get rid of all the variables, this is this is the trade-off. I mean, it's a very interesting language design trade-off. You get rid of all the variables, there's no weird stuff like this, but unfortunately us humans can't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in a sense, the, you know, but your notion of a variable, so, so can you explain for a second, what is your notion? You, you again got two levels of notion of a variable. You've got an object language variable and you've got your pattern language or your scheme language variable. Right. Is that right? Yes. Uh, okay, the, the object language variables are completely different from this uh, in the sense that, well, let's just take a simple example. Let me go back to, but by the way, let's step back a minute. Let me go back to um, show you the whole system that MetaMath works. And then we can talk about in de more detail. First of all, we have um, propositional calculus that I don't know how many people have seen in axiomatization. Uh, this is the most standard one in most textbooks, and it's fine. Uh, with propositional calculus only, it's really not um, that difficult. You can work directly with schemes because there are no side conditions at all. So, so wait a second, the primitive symbols here are not and implies. Is that right. correct? That's correct. And, and what's the difference between your, oh, I see modus ponens down there has, I'm now a little bit confused by that. The single arrow is 
watt. What is okay? The this arrow? this actually the ampersand and the single arrow are not part of the language. It means that we have a hypothesis phi, another hypothesis phi implies psi. The conclusion is psi. Um, I just put the ampersand and arrow in there to sort of compress it into one line. If you actually look at modus ponens, let me click on it here. You'll see that um, it's an axiom with two hypotheses and a conclusion. So this is probably what you're more, you know, the minor hypothesis major and the conclusion. So let me understand. I mean, there's sort of the metalogic level of some kind of entailment and there's the actual propositional logic of implies and not and things like this. Uh, am I to understand that those different symbols are the one is at the level of the metalogic, one is at the level of actual propositional logic, or how, how should I understand that? Okay, this, this arrow here uh, that, you know, in the major premise, mm -hmm. uh, that's at the level, that's part of the scheme language, but it's actually, we just use the same symbol for both the scheme language and the object language. An object language statement would, the object language will have some variables, call them V1, V2, V3. They're like, you know, fixed constants in a set theoretical description of logic. Um, an actual object language statement would be something like, you know, V1 equals V1 implies v2 equals v2 or something like that. Um, there is no psi at the level of the object language. Those all go away. You have to put actual expressions in place of them. Psi is a placeholder for a formula, a well-formed formula that has a certain definition. Um, let me go back here. Um, so to, just so I understand, in, in my context, mm -hmm. these, these would be, um, Mario can perhaps Correct this. I mean, these the phi would basically just be a phi blank. It it represents an expression. Is yes. That correct. You have to. Yeah. And okay. and the, to get to the object language, you will have to replace it with an actual expression of the object language. It can be a very complicated expression, a simple one. Okay, but but, 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 but the phi itself does language, not exist in the object language. In the object language, is everything a literal? In some sense, I mean, is there still an X in the algebraic sense of the formula X squared minus one or something? Can you still operate on things which are algebraic variables? Not in the really. Object language? Um, well, they, it, it depends. They on, called, on... They're called variables, but you can't like substitute something for them using the rules of the object language itself. You have to like use a meta theorem or something to do that. So so, go ahead, Ben. Right. Uh, yeah, so so in this uh, in in propositional calculus, uh, whoops, Maria is, is um, um, it, it has formulas, right? But Maria, uh, you, because you, it, it you, just you've, doesn't you froze oh. again. We we didn't. Uh, so if there are, if if there are no um, if there are no atoms, then this bottoms out to nothing and so there's no no variables but if let's let's say that we have as our atoms just true and false okay that would be a valid uh instantiation of propositional calculus and there are no variables in the object language right so uh when, once you actually substitute in some uh concrete expression it would uh be something like true and tr true implies true implies not false or something like that yep. um, those would be the only actual formulas um, and then uh, whenever you substitute, uh, like whenever you're, you're proving these schemes, they're really schemes that are talking about formulas of that kind, okay? And there are no, no variables. However, if you think about what happens when you uh, use uh, first order logic, now there are actually variables in the object language. There's like V0s and V1s. Um, so for instance, an atom of the propositional uh, uh, calculus would be like v0 equals v0. Um, and so when, when we, you know, bottom out, so substitute in an actual formula, that it would still have a variable, but it's a variable of a different kind, right? It's a, it's a, it's an, it's a variable over a first order variable, I guess. Um, but it's not, complicated, a guys. it's not a phi. This is complicated. Um, <laughs> okay, let me um, sit. Okay, but before we get in, let's look at propositional calculus some more. 
uh, just to get a concrete feeling that what we're doing is not different from textbooks in sort of a, in some ways, it's not different at all from propositional calculus. Um, the top of the screen here shows the proof from a textbook and the bottom of the screen is a proof in Metamath. It's exactly the same. You'll see the application of modus ponens and you'll see the axioms one and axioms two instances of them, which are also schemes um, <clears throat> being used as part of the proof. And it matches exactly what is in Hamilton's book here. But, um, but so wait a second, there's, there's some meta thing going on here. So I understand that, I mean, th there has to be some substitution that is a meta thing yes. that is beyond, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you look at axiom, let's just take line four here. Um, axiom AX-1 says phi implies psi implies phi. We have substituted, we've taken a special case of that, phi implies phi implies phi, um, that we've made into axiom one. This, this number, step two is also a substitution instance of axiom uh, AX-1. Are, are, are you... Uh, I can't see the screen here. Yeah, I think I think you've got something covering up. Um, oh, I, we can see uh, the screen. The, I can oh, see okay. The screen. Oh, all right, that's probably just my connection. Then. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Um, each each step in the proof is, and when I say instantiation, what I mean is another scheme resulting from substitution into the axiom scheme. We're taking scheme variables, it's sort of like, now I'm not that familiar with Mathematica, but uh, when you talk about the blank variables, that's what the underscore you mean after that, yeah. like X underscore. It's yeah. like, you know, substituting X underscore with- um, A concrete with, expression. With Z underscore plus, you know, Q underscore or something. It's like, you, you, but you haven't, you've, you've still kept it at the level of, at the highest level of a scheme. I don't know if you can do that in mathematics. Yeah, 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 you can. Okay, yeah, yeah I you figured can. you could. I mean, we, we don't do that much with it, but you can absolutely do that. There's nothing- Exactly, that that's completely. exactly what we're doing here. Okay. We're not going to the object language of, let's say, plugging in numbers in places of X okay. and- So let me see if I can summarize. So the meta thing that's happening is substitution, but the substitution you're doing is you're typically substituting patterns for patterns. Yes. And yes. at some point, uh, un, way, way underneath, eventually mm -hmm. you may instantiate this with actual, the patterns with actual object literal things. You but could, you're mostly yes. doing manipulations mm -hmm. at the pattern level. Right. Uh, yeah, MetaMath, okay, in principle, that's what your sort of, what the intent is to ultimately get something that you substitute for actual primitive variables of the object language. Mm -hmm. In MetaMath, we never get to that point because it's not even, the language doesn't even know about that. The scheme variables are the primitives of the language. Okay, so what is the, the number one? Does the number one exist in any sense in the language or is the, is the number that one? That gets in this, no, it doesn't exist in the language. It's a defined constant. I mean, the whole subject of definitions is a different <laughs> thing, but it, um, when we get in, okay, with just logic, propositional and predicate logic, uh, we can't really do much in terms of, we can't express like the number one, there's no place to even put number one in this. It's like, I'm not, it doesn't mean anything. When we get into set theory, we develop something called class terms uh, that are amenable to having things defined for them like the number one. But that's a rather advanced topic for the purpose of this discussion right, right now, okay? Um, that's the next level, is to get into class terms and that in the number one is one of those. Well, so, so wait a second, when we talk about mathematics, I mean, this is sort of a, a foundational question about mathematics. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a level of doing mathematics, which is just pattern symbol manipulation, where, mm -hmm. for example, the, the theorems you're showing here would be you know, we could establish these independent of knowing what phi stands for, whether it can be true or false, whether it can be apples or oranges, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't make mm -hmm. any difference. And so the question, um, but 
this idea of a, you know, this notion that there's something different, a literal one. I mean, I think Russell, for example, tried to avoid that. People have been trying to avoid that for years of, I don't really want a literal one ever. I just want to, um, uh, to define that in some way in terms of my, my non-literal things. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering, uh, are you, with what you call definitions, are you basically that, I mean, to me, there's some sort of abstract symbolic mathematics and there's mathematics that we humans talk about that involves, I mean, we could imagine we could do purely symbolic operations where there is a thing that represents a one, there's a thing that represents a plus, but those things are, um, uh, we, we don't say that that thing represents a plus. Mm -hmm. It's just a, an abstract object and we never describe it and, and we never give it a human name. And so you're about so, so to I have, I have uh, something to, to add to this, which, which uh, m might differ a little bit from Norm's point of view, which is, I would say, I would say that uh, one uh, in, in, uh, in our language, the one does exist. One is a, uh, one is a constant symbol. So uh, you have, you know, the ability to construct terms with, uh, with, with like formula constructors. These are basically term constructors that take some number of arguments. Um, and, you know, you can have a term constructor that takes no arguments. Um, so this would be a lot like, um, uh, uh, well, well, We lost you. you. You keep on dropping out at the. At I the mean, in maples, but in. in uh, Sorry, you have to re say that the, sentence because we lost you for a moment there. Um, so, the. Uh, I, I'm not sure to what extent uh, Mathematica distinguishes between constants and variables, but here we're really thinking of those as, as different and a constant. You can't substitute for a constant. Um, so one is a constant. It's it's a it's a term constructor that produces in this case a, a class or a natural number or whatever the sort is, um, and uh, and 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 you can you can form uh, like your scheme variables can be substituted in for something containing like a one, just an actual one constant symbol. Um, so that's that that's the sense in which the language has a one, and then definitional. In, uh, Extensions is is how you justify the addition of a bunch of new constants to the language uh, without causing inconsistencies. Hmm. You know this whole thing. Variables are just, uh, you know, they're such a complicated concept. I mean, it. it um, uh, yeah, we. we let, let's. I'd, I'd like to talk about your stuff, but I could tell you more about what we've done with axiomatic theories in recent times and some of the issues we've had with defining. What is, what is a true variable versus a, you know, this whole question about variables, constants, functions, you know, quantification and so on. It, it gets some, it, it's, I think, uh, you know, it's at some level, you can obviously get rid of all of that stuff, but then humans can't understand what's going on. And I think there's this complicated trade-off of, you know, what is mathematics? Is mathematics this very abstract thing that sort of operates even without humans? Or is it something where we are trying to attach sort of human significance to some of the things that are going on? But, but Norm, you were, you were about to show some... some um, uh, okay, so we've got here... What, what's the difference between the, the, the Greek, the phi's and the x's? Are they, are they the same kind of thing or is there a difference? No, in Greek uh, there are two types of variables. There are sorts. I don't know what... It's officially called in computer science. Mario knows better, but uh, basically, uh, the Greek symbols can be substituted with formulas. So, uh, for example, the rule of generalization: we could have uh, the formula phi implies phi substituted on both sides, as long as it's done uniformly throughout. Um, the red uh, letters are called individual variables. We actually call them set vars because we use them for a set in set theory. Uh, <clears throat> they always end up representing variables that range over sets. But um, there's a distinction between this, this the, um, sorry, let me go back. The individual variables like the red X, um, they can only be substituted with other individual variables they can't be substituted with expressions at this level. 
Um, there are later things we develop in set theory called class variables, a third kind of variable that can be substituted with expressions like one plus one or that sort of thing. Uh, but at the level of the predicate logic um, that we use, the red variables can only be substituted with, with you know, you can basically only rename them. Now, um, this, okay, let me, these are our axioms for predicate calculus. Um, let me just give a, a quick overview here. Um, <clears throat> just, just one comment. I mean, the, the, you know, one feature of our language, both in language, mathematical, whatever, is there is only one type. Everything is an expression. So everything can get substituted for everything. And, you know, it's always been interesting to me. I've, I've been a very non-enthusiast of types. And by the time it's you got types and sorts and kinds and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. it's like the boat is sinking somehow because it's kind of like, you know, why do you need all this stuff? I mean, can you can you kind of give a, a I mean, beyond you know Russell's original justification for types, and beyond, you know, like in our compiler, we certainly use types because we have to interface with the reality of the hardware that people have built and so on. Mm -hmm. But my question is from a more conceptual point of view, by the time we've got you know, types and kinds and sorts and all this kind of thing, why do we need that? What, what, what is the thing that, that forces one to, what is the sort of, you know, you know if, if you were to just you know, travel back a hundred and whatever it is, 110 years or something before, before any of that stuff got invented, why would one have said, oh, there's going to have to be all these different sorts and kinds and types and so on. Why, why is that going to be needed? Okay. Um, I, first of all, I'm not sure. I, that, that's sort of a, well, it's a, both a philosophical and practical question. This is how it's defined in textbooks. Now, um, one of the things that I was very diligent about in Metamath was to keep it down to three types only. So once you've got classes, that's the last type you'll ever encounter. All right, you'll okay. never so you introduce any more types. Okay, so it's not more and more and more types. Yeah, you this is this three. is one of the reasons why I, I prefer to call them sorts rather than types is because okay. people coming from type theory generally expect there to be a whole uh, right. grammar of types and like you know the arrow types and and the structures and you know all the stuff you use is in it, programming uh, languages so when you use the term type people have that that idea but, don't but people also can't you also build that tower on top of sorts as well or are you using sorts as some kind of generic term that refers to uh, kinds in meta mathematica in our parlance say it again um, so, so uh, in in our parlance, Mathematico, we would say that it has one sort, right, uh, which is the sort of expressions. Uh, yes. And then we're doing something which is just very little bit above that, which is we have three sorts. We have one for uh, well-formed formulas, one for set variables, and one for uh, class terms. Just, just for my curiosity, if you look at other kind of math formalization systems. Can you kind of classify them by the number of sorts they involve? Like how many sorts does lean involve? Uh, an infinite number. Yeah. So, well, okay, actually, no, that's... No, it depends stops on, at like four. Again, it depends on what you mean by... Well, so there... So lean has a type theory. So it has a, a, a grammar of, of types and it classifies its terms according to types. And those types, there are an infinite number of them. Um, because they have, you know, their constructors for making as many, uh, you know, you can. What's the type know, of list of list of list or whatever? Wait a minute. What's the type um, of all types? It, so there's there's a there's an infinite universe of types. So so uh, there's type zero is of type type one, and type one is of type type two. Um, so this is you need to do something like this in order to avoid inconsistencies. But so that's actually a different kind of thing. So you have types, and then you have this hierarchy of types of types. Is that correct? Those are all those those that hierarchy is itself. Those are all types, right? Uh, it, it each one is like a. They're called universes. They're basically types of all types uh, at a lower level. Those are a different uh, type of type, aren't they? Than the than the base types. That is the type of all types uh, is not itself a type, is it? No, no, no. It is in 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 Lean's type theory. Every every object is. 
I froze again. Types of types are basically these universes, and they are themselves terms and types. Um, so, so they're really they're all in, inclusion with it. So, so uh, type zero has a type which is type one. Um, so, type one is a type. Okay, okay, okay. All right, but but so. Can so you th this basically unifies everything into one, what, what in metamath, we would call that just one sort. There's one sort of terms and it's just everything. Um, and then we have this, this binary relation, which is like this term is the type of that other term. Uh, and that's sort of what, what we imagine Lean is doing. Okay, but, but so your sort of three levels of, of sorts of thing, can you kind of justify from a more foundational point of view, why are there three? Why not seven? Why not? Why not? I mean, what, what's the, is there some kind of thing about the nature of mathematics that tells you that three is a good number for this? Okay. First, first of all, let me just say that in principle, we can get by with only two, the uh, blue variables ranging over well-formed formulas and the red variables that represent um, individual variables. Now, uh, going deeper than that, why two and why not one? I'm not sure, uh, somebody else, Mario Petroli addressed uh, that. Maybe. Yeah. But uh, let me just well, finish, it, oh, first of all, okay. let me finish the, the class terms, uh, which is a third type that we introduce later, they're done for efficiency. You can prove things a lot more efficiently if you have those available. Otherwise, you can't really define things, meaning you can't define like the number one. You have to use a very long expression that's incomprehensible whenever you want to refer reference one. And class terms let you do that. So um, the third type is more of a convenience to make it practical to work with. Now, Mario, go ahead. Um. Yeah, so, so the reason why metamath needs at least two is because we need variables and then we need, uh, uh, we need composed expressions. So if you only have variables, then because of this constraint that variables can only be substituted for other variables, um, you would never get anywhere. The only things you could ever have are single variables and there's nothing to prove. Um, if you only have composed expressions, then you don't have the ability to create binders. Um, so you can't really do first order logic or anything that depends on this not free nonsense. Um, so uh, that both of those are kind of essential features for uh, doing, doing uh, mathematics in, in general. You can still kind of get by with, with just the one if you're doing like propositional calculus, if you don't care about binding variables. Um, but you need at least two to get ZFC. Once you have ZFC, you know, we have, uh, we know that we can do pretty much anything in mathematics, but uh, as Norm said, um, you, you don't wanna have to write formulas for everything because uh, one is not a formula, it's a term. Um, and so being able to talk about one is, is useful. And uh, so that's where class terms come in. They give us a way to have terms. Uh, let me mention one other thing here. Um, the actual object language of mathematics has only one type, which is the object level variable. Um, there are no variables ranging over formulas. The reason we have two um, is that we want to be able to define schemes of things, which the object language can't do. So uh, that the actual object language of math only needs one variable type. What about functions? What about f of x? Why can't I quantify? Well, we define all of that stuff later. They're all defined in terms of, um, they're very okay. complicated expressions, but they're all, they, they're, they can all be defined in terms of just uh, a single variable with extremely long expression. All right. Let's maybe we should get off this horrifying topic of variables because this is a very this is a just a you know it's it's the bane of much of kind of mathematical logic and um, um, <clears throat> there there is no. one thing I want to uh, mention last about this though which is that um, 
Although MetaMath is taking this sort of unusual route via schemes, what, what I really like about it is the fact that uh, once you're only thinking about schemes, you end up with a version that you, you end up with something that looks a lot like first order logic again, except now suddenly the foundations of it are simpler. You don't have to worry about not freeness. You only have to worry about this sort of syntactic transformations on terms. Um, substitution becomes very simple. It's just sort of string substitution. You go into a token and then whenever you have a variable, you stick in a, a list of, of tokens. It, it all becomes very, very simple to implement. Um, and so this is, this is one of the reasons why um, it's incredibly easy to write a MetaMath verifier. And there have been you know, dozens of verifiers that have been written um, just because it's, you know, it's, it's a simple thing to do and, and it gives you all this, it's, it's very powerful feeling to know, oh, I can, I can verify this huge body of mathematics with only these few primitives. I only need to know string substitution and uh, like you go through a list of tokens and see whether there's an X there and that's it. Like that, okay, so, that's so all you need in order to implement. The two primitive operations that you have are substitution and essentially membership and uh, syntactic membership testing where syntactic membership testing is done, you, you build up lazily this collection of membership tests and only at some final moment when you actually instantiate things, do you did all the membership tests run and you find out whether, whether the thing is valid or not. Is that, is that right? The, the, the syntactic membership tests are actually being run on the, on the spot, but they're being run on the scheme variables. So we're doing a, a syntactic membership test of the expression that was substituted um, in order to see that that expression, uh, all of the scheme variables in it themselves have this uh, disjoint variable condition. So uh, we've, we've essentially internalized that, that notion of not free for the, the underlying expressions since we're only working with scheme variables, we just have this thing where we say, okay, for everything in the term, they are all supposed to not contain an X in this sort of uh, other syntactic way. Um, so it, it really does notice. boil down to a, a, a syntactic, just go through the list and see whether everything um, doesn't- There's Something I, I fundamentally don't understand. If we're saying X blank is free of Y blank, mm -hmm. okay? If these have not been instantiated, how do we know that at some moment in the future, Y will not suddenly get a W, which is exactly the thing that also appears in the X blank. How do we know that there isn't going to be some, you know, moment in the future? I mean, we have this issue in, in you know, in Wolfram Language and Mathematica, we have the issue, you know, solve generically or solve, you know, with the possibility that the X that's there could be equal to the Y that's there. So to mm -hmm. speak, and we and we distinguish yeah. those two. You know, for doing algebra, we choose to just have different families of functions that deal with those two cases. But how do you avoid that in this thing where you're testing for membership? How how do you not have something where sometime in the future these things could be not syntactically independent? So so um, that that that's that's a great question. And we lost the answer. Uh, okay, the I think what he might have been going to say is uh, um, the variable provisos on the variables hold on, hold on that exist Mario, in it. So let's we, say we, that we lost you. Uh, we have wait, X. Wait a minute. We lost the critical answer here. Okay, it was a great question. Um, so, and so so uh, each uh, uh, scheme. Let's say that each scheme has uh, a disjoint variable provisos on it. So let's say that we have x and phi, and then we have a disjoint variable proviso that says that x is supposed to not uh, x and phi are supposed to be disjoint. Okay. Now let's suppose that we substitute in for phi um, some like a, uh, uh, I don't know a and b just for simplicity. So uh, where a and b is the expression. Um, and A and B are two more scheme variables. Um, and uh, we're saying that it's supposed to be disjoint from X. So, so we go through the, the expression, we see, ah, oh, it's got an A and it's got a B. And so now we check, okay, does A have a disjoint variable provisor with X? And does B have a disjoint variable provisor with X? Um, if so, then this is okay. If not, then this is not okay. That's all it is. Yeah, it, let me just mention that the way I look at it is basically, um, we carry the provisos forward. So one proviso, if we substitute in a complex expression, can turn into multiple provisos. Uh, everything is inherited forward. So there's never a possibility of anything being violated in the future because 
you carry them all forward with you. Now you think that, well, that's gonna cause a huge blow up of the number of provisos. Well, it's, you can't have more than you have variables in the expression to begin with. So, or, you know, combinations of those. So it's self-limiting. Fair enough. Okay, so, so, okay, so let's, go, let's go back to, you've got a set of, of you, you've got your sort of meta process, which is substitution plus proviso management, so to speak. I mean, that's, that's your underlying uh, sort of meta logic operations, so to speak. Now, now you want to define mathematics. Um, I mean, presumably the aliens could also use metamath, so to speak, and they could define a completely different kind of mathematics whose meta logic is still using substitution and provisos. Is that a true statement? I mean, in other words, the, you're, you're about to say there are these particular axioms which give us human mathematics. Is, is that true or is that, did I miss something here? Is that, do we, do we lose the audio? Mario? Yeah. Um, oh, okay, okay. I, I mean, the, uh, there's, I guess there's, there's these two levels, right? Uh, Metamath is a logical framework. So it lets you define the logical system that you want to work in. Um, and then let's say ZFC is a particular instantiation of that. So, so you'll, you'll, you'll have Metamath as your verifier, and then you're going to write down the axioms of ZFC, and then you're going to do a bunch of mathematics in ZFC. Now you could write different axioms in ZFC, and maybe the aliens would, right? They'd, they'd still be using Metamath for some reason, but they've, they've written some completely different set of, uh, of axioms. Uh, and in fact, uh, on the Metamath website, there's actually quite a few uh, databases using very different kinds of, of logic. Um, so, you know, you can experiment with the, the, the logic that you, you, you're interested in, in investigating. You can do like modal logics or, or other kinds of more unusual logics. Um, but the so fundamental I, I concept would say that, here, oh. but the fundamental concept is substitution plus provisos is the basically right. what you're saying. So, so this is okay. Yeah. I, that really helps me understand. And, and I see this. It's sort of a church Turing thesis kind of situation where you know this this really is the fundamentals of like what it takes to do mathematics in a computer is that you have to have the ability to do essentially the equivalent of substitution and uh, I'm still not entirely. <laughs> we lost you there. Okay. Um, let me just logic and. But Maria, we we said you you know you need substitution. Look, and the thing that's been a surprise to me in the last forty years or so is you know I started off with this concept of transformations for symbolic expressions as kind of the fundamental way to do computation. And it's worked unbelievably well. And, but what I'm doing is something a little bit different from what you're doing, which is we define a bunch of transformations for symbolic expressions, for patterns for symbolic expressions, and then we have an evaluator that's basically running to a fixed point. And that's, that is you know, the sort of formal summary of what our language does. Now, what I think you're doing is instead of running to a fixed point, you're saying, there are these transformations between symbolic expressions. You have an additional type of primitive, which is like our slash semicolon, but you have a more specialized version of that, which allows you to actually deal with it symbolically. And But your purpose is not running to a fixed point. Your purpose is, as I understand it, well, can you describe that? I mean, this this is something I've always well, found. I, Go ahead. I, I would say that, that uh, I mean, we don't, necessarily need to run it to a fixed point and to the extent that we do um we're really just uh let you know the, essentially the mathematician has the reins there on what's to be evaluated in what order um so you know you're you get to prove whatever theorems you feel like um and uh, the what metamath is providing is essentially the set of all provable theorems right it's it provides the the structure of that tree that you could potentially explore. And then, you know, the mathematician will look at that tree and say, mm, that's an interesting part of the tree. I want to go there. Um, right. so, so, I mean, what, what we're doing in Wolfram language is, you know, we're driving down, we're saying, take this set of transformations. I'm just going to keep applying those transformations until I hit a fixed point. What you're doing, as I understand it, is you're going to say, I'm going to describe in metamath, in a metamath proof, I'm going to describe a path where every step in that path satisfies the, um, uh, 
the, the, the constraints of this kind of substitution setup. So in other words, you're, you're, you know, it's something which we have never been able to do very well. I've, I've tried to work on this for, oh, solidly 35 years, is the representation of the execution history of a Wolfram language evaluation. So in other words, it's what you're showing here, as I understand it, is you're going to show in one of your proofs, you're basically showing this is the sequence of transformations that get you from this thing to this thing. And where and we've got, you know, in our find equational proof in Wolfram language now, we've got something which is doing fairly industrial scale kind of representation of what substitutions you need to give. But we don't have a great way to that, that's not the focus of what we're doing. We're just saying. All we want is the result of the substitution. Whereas what I think you're doing here is to represent what substitution you are doing. So for us, if we have some function, you know, f of x blank and y blank and so on, all we care about is what the result of instantiating those variables and transforming to the right-hand side is. Whereas what you're doing is you're recording things like, you know, you're effectively recording what was instantiated for those variables and so on. What, uh, I mean, I think, I think this is the relationship between these things. I mean, one is, what you're describing is the path. We're describing uh, a particular endpoint of the path defined by our evaluator. Do you think that's a correct um, uh, interpretation? Well, sure. I mean, the the basically the path is the proof, and mm -hmm. the endpoint is the statement, right? So mm -hmm. you want uh, whenever you're doing mathematics, you care about both. You you certainly care about the statement because you know that's that's what you're interested in proving. We also care about the proof, or at least. Well, some people care about the proof. This is a very interesting question for us is, you know, we've provided proof objects now for a few years. And it's computation. Say again? Oh. You, you, um, you so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you need the, the, the proof in order for, let's say, people to replay it and for it to be sort of computationally efficient um, to do so. Um, and uh, that, that, that's one of the other areas where, where MetaMath in particular shines is that it's extremely computationally efficient to verify these proofs. Um, and that, that's one of the areas bit. where I think others can look at. Right, so I mean, the, this concept of proofs as a symbolic object, you know, this is an interesting thing. And that's, that was kind of the original vision of, of the Whitehead Russell Principia Mathematica is math is about proof and we're gonna, you know, our book is full of proofs, basically. Um, you know, in people using Mathematica, for example, our Mathematica, um, you know, they don't care about the proofs. They just say, I want the answer. It's a slightly different kind of use case. But I think it's very interesting to try to understand. So, so by the way, you know, in our models of physics now, the, you know, the history of the universe is a bunch of proofs, basically. So in that sense, we now care about proofs because we're living inside the proofs, so to speak. I mean, the, 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 the definition of our history is a proof, basically. Um, so, so that's a reason to care about proofs. But, but I think one of the things is, given a, you know, a proof object, what you're showing me on the screen here, I think, well, you're showing me axioms, but I would assume that there will be another page where you could show me a proof, which is a, a series of of. So, so in a sense, every step in one of your proofs, as I understand it, is you pull in, you, you basically have two objects coming in and one object coming out. Is that right? The two objects coming in are the expression you have, some substitution you're going to make, and then the result of substituting into that. I mean, I, I understand that all these things are schemes, but yeah, scheme that would be one, one, one proof step. A uh, proof might have many steps. What you're describing is a single proof step. Exactly. But yes, that's that's pretty accurate. Right. <clears throat> so I mean that that looks very much like I mean like in our find equational proof function, what you will see is a bunch of you know you can you can make a proof network there, and what you will see is a bunch of of uh, two inputs, one output type things, where it's like uh, you know a thing, the 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 axiom, the lemma, the whatever that's going to be used, and then that produces through essentially a law of inference it produces a, a new result, That's which right. can then be used elsewhere. Yes. So, okay, so then we see mathematics in some sense as a big ocean of these statements that are floating around. And to make progress, the mathematician picks up in a series, a, a, many times over, picks up a pair of statements 
and uses some kind of law of inference to deduce another statement. Is, is, that, is that kind of your, your meta-meta yes. meta view of mathematics? Yes. I, I'll just say that the goal of, math, of meta-math, at least in my view originally, is simply to document with you know, extreme rigor mathematical proofs. To have, so there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the thing is proved correctly. Um, it's not to find new proofs, although people have looked at things in those directions. Uh, one of the focuses of most other uh, languages is to find proofs. Meta math doesn't. Well, it, I think it, there are different. I mean, th to me, there are three, at least three kinds of things, or mm -hmm. sorts or types or whatever we call them. Um, you know, there is the computation evaluation type of thing, which is the, the, you know, the main thing we try to do in modern language. There is the proof assistant kind of thing where you're given certain puzzle pieces and you're asked, the mathematician is asked, can you fit these puzzle pieces together? And, you know, and that's, I think, more the, 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 um, the tradition that you're, you're operating or defining here. And the third thing would be the actual automated theorem proving system where you're told, you know, here's the raw material, now computer, go find a path mm -hmm. that gets from the raw material to the answer. Right. Um, that and, is uh, not meta math. Uh -huh. Right. I mean, it so, could be in theory, in principle, but in practice, uh, that wasn't the goal. And, um, you right. know, so, so I'm sure you could operate, you know, the automated theorem proving techniques that yeah. like we have and right. so on, you could presumably operate those within right. meta math to right. automatically find a path. Um, yeah. Uh, other tools can generate proofs that then MetaMath can verify, but mm -hmm. MetaMath itself is it primarily intended just to verify proofs with, you know, essentially absolute rigor. So there's no question right. that there can't, you know, the, the likelihood that there's a bug that has told us that everything is, that something is proved when it's not, especially given that there have been so many verifiers written in so many different computer languages, it's almost zero. Right, right, right. So, so right. I mean, this is you know substitution plus uh, plus conditions is right. It's you know, as simple as you can possibly get. Right. Well, I very much like your idea of just using substitution because I think you know whenever I've seen people doing I don't know you know whether it's you know the whole paramodulation or you know all these different complicated contortions mm -hmm. to get from um, from one step to the next. I I I mean I've always assumed that substitution is the ultimate thing that you're going to end up using. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's a good thing to see. But so now, I mean, if we turn to, all right, so we've got this framework, we've got this raw material, now we can build mathematics, and we might build it with, uh, you know, we're assuming substitution is a, is, a, is a raw principle that everything's going to be based on. It's something, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in that principle. It's the principle that Wolfram Language is based on. It's also the principle implicitly that our physics project is based on. Substitution for, you know, hypergraphs about atoms of space rather than substitution for, you know, terms and variables and things like this. But it's the same, same kind of idea. But mm -hmm. so now let's talk about what human mathematics is in that context. So, you know, what I think you're saying is you're saying, let's take ZFC. ZFC was delivered to us as a kind of, um, uh, you know, it's just like, like w w as I understand it, you're choosing ZFC, the aliens could choose something different, somebody else could choose Piano arithmetic, somebody else could choose some category theory based approach. And you're saying all of those things at a meta level can operate using substitution. They, 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 they are mm -hmm. there. And, and so now the question would be in, okay, this artifact that is human mathematics that sits on top of substitution, what, what can we say about that artifact? That is, is it, I mean, do we believe that the ZFC artifact is somehow equivalent to the category theory artifact, is somehow equivalent to some other artifact? You know, one of the things I found surprising, you know, I looked a little bit, as, as you know, at the sort of statistics of, of proofs in, in MetaMath and Lean and so on. And, you know, one of the things that surprised me was everybody can prove the Pythagorean theorem, even though the axioms underneath are different. Is that, I mean, do you agree with that statement and what would you make of that? Well, um, yeah, I, I agree with that. But uh, in, in ZFC, for example, um, at least 
for most things we care about, I mean, we can derive the axioms of category theory. The category theory can derive the axioms of ZFC. Uh, I don't, I, there might be some uh, gotchas there, but pretty much that shows their equivalent in terms of what their capability of producing the same mathematics. Well, okay, but I think that you have to be careful about that. So I think at one level, everything is a universal computer and everything can represent everything. Mm -hmm. The question is what level of interpretation are you allowing? And, you know, it's perfectly possible to have, you know, to use the raw material of Diophantine equations to emulate Turing machines and to do this and to emulate that. And, and you know, there's nothing wrong with using, once you have, okay, Diophantine equations are creatures of piano arithmetic. Diophantine equations can simulate Turing machines. Turing machines could simulate ZFC. So how can it be the case that ZFC is more powerful than piano arithmetic? Well, the answer is you're saying that the type of mathematical simulation that's allowed is not the full computational, universal computation type simulation. So I think it's a tricky thing. What you're going to allow as a kind of mathematical simulation versus what you allow in kind of the computation level, I tend to think the computation level is the more relevant one and the mathematical level is a kind of arbitrary uh, reduction, which I suspect is less than your substitution thing. I think your substitution thing is much closer to the raw computation level, at which point, you know, one of the things that would make it unsurprising that you can prove things with a bunch of different axiom systems is, well, yes, they're all capable of universal computation and you can emulate one axiom system with another. But the question is, you know, does that then mean, you know, but on the other hand, we don't imagine that we can, that there's, we don't imagine that we can prove that two plus two equals five. We imagine there's a set of things we can prove and a set of things we can't prove and or a set of things that will be. So, I mean, I guess the thing that I'm trying to understand is if, if it is the case that the raw material, I'm, I'm trying to understand what is this thing, and I have some ideas about it, what is this thing that is the stuff that seems to be true independent of these low-level axioms you know, the Pythagorean theorem is true even when you use two different axiom systems underneath. How do you think about that? I mean, okay, so one view of it that I would have sort of from a physics point of view is when we look at fluid mechanics, we're looking at, you know, the motion of a fluid at a large scale. It doesn't matter whether the fluid is made of air or water and has different molecules underneath. We still get fluid mechanics. So that's, that's potentially a, a, a metaphor for what happens in mathematics, perhaps, I don't know if that's correct, that in some sense, the, the, there is a structure of mathematics that's at the level of the fluid mechanics, different from the level of the molecular dynamics, and you can change the molecular dynamics out from underneath it, you can change the underlying axiom systems and so on, but still wind up with the fluid mechanics level. At least this is a, this is a, a possible thought about what's going on. I, I don't know if that's right. I don't know if that disagrees with, resonates with, or, or whatever. Um, uh, what the, the kind of experience that you've had in, in actually, you know, in actually sort of curating mathematics in the context of metamath. Uh, um, so, so I, I, I'm familiar with the, 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 your, your, you know, you've talked about the, the principle of computational equivalence uh, in your book and, um, and the church Turing thesis uh, is, is also somewhat similar to this, where it's like, you get to a certain level and then everything becomes sort of the same, where where everything can simulate everything else, um, and and I see is something similar happening at the level of of uh, mathematical foundations. There's a certain uh, bare level uh, somewhere around piano arithmetic, uh, maybe a little bit less, um, where you can. See we lost you again. I'm telling you, it's the, it's the punchlines we lose. Mm -hmm. you, you can talk. Um, say, um, say again, Mario. And, and you lost can, you off you can, to piano arithmetic. Uh, so, so you you somewhere below piano arithmetic, there's there's this level where you can talk about theories and you can talk about how um, whether something is derivable, and you can sort of do mathematics at that level. Um, and once you have that, 
all of the the theories can basically simulate every other theory. So you have, you know, ZFC can simulate category theory, category theory can, you know, simulate uh, piano arithmetic and, and vice versa. Like, it, it doesn't matter at that point. Um, so uh, as long as you have something that's capable of understanding those primitives, then you can do all of these mathematics. Well, yeah, what you're effectively describing there, I mean, this principle of computational equivalence that that I have is this basic statement. Once your system does non-trivial things, it will do the same things that any other system can do. Right. And and um, you know, and the threshold for that we can discuss. You know, there's this complicated boundary of of at what point is it only doing simple things? Is it like just producing you know periodic behavior or something? At what point does it that does ascend beyond that? But from that point of view, your but then the, the problem is. There's something about mathematics that is more than just saying it's pure. There's a texture to mathematics that goes beyond the pure, uh, you know, the purely computational, so to speak. And, you know, among empirical observations, the comparative unimportance of undecidability in practical mathematics is one sign of that issue. So I think the analogy there is if you're doing fluid mechanics, the fact that there is a lot of, in my language, computational irreducibility in the molecular dynamics that's going on, on underneath, you don't care. For most purposes, you can still solve the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid flow, even without knowing all those microscopic details of the molecular dynamics. Sometimes those microscopic details will stick their head out, and that happens when you try and you know, ultimately prove existence and uniqueness for Navier-Stokes. You start worry, having to, in a sense, worry about that. The, the, um, but most of the time, you can just happily go along operating at the Navier-Stokes level. And so the question is, in what sense is that true? You know, to what extent? Okay, what, when, when you look at Metamath, let's ask a concrete question. You look at Metamath, you're going to build in layers. You've got the underlying axioms, the very low-level stuff. Then eventually, you're going to build up to the Pythagorean theorem. Then you're going to build to more things. To what extent can you observe layering? In the structure, in the in the um, in the graph of, I mean, you, I know I've drawn, and I, maybe you've drawn too, some of these graphs of the the relationships between theorems in Metamath, um, and you know you can kind of see these different fields of mathematics that contribute to each other and so on. Actually, I've got two questions there. Um, the well, one one question would be, you know, what is your sense of what that graph looks like? You've got the the axioms at the bottom. And that's kind of the big bang of mathematics and analogous to the big bang of physics where the universe started with some limited amount of stuff. And then the dynamics of the physical evolution of the physical universe produced all the stuff in the universe. So we are to think that in mathematics, at least in the Hilbert view of things, we start from the big bang of a small number of axioms and then we grow all of the rest of mathematics. What can we say about that growth process? Uh, okay, one of the things, well, I'm not sure this answers the question exactly, but let's just take um, the numbers, uh, you know, one, two, three is or complex number, real numbers is the developed under ZFC. They're different approaches that are dramatically different in all their details. You know, uh, to, you can use Dedekind cuts to get reals, you can use Cauchy sequences to get reals. Um, that they're completely different. The bottom line is that you want to end up with some um, entities that have certain properties. So you figure out clever ways to manipulate the axioms to get those properties. And uh, so you can call, you know, a number one derived under Dedekind cuts is a different set in terms of the details and a number one derived with Cauchy sequences, but in the end of the same thing in terms of their properties. And now you can also abstract out the properties and just sort of define real numbers as um, a certain uh, <clears throat> closed field and um, forget how they're derived. You know, the derivations simply prove that they exist under set theory, but beyond that point, you only care about their properties, not the details of how they are constructed. Well, so this is some kind of, 
you know, okay, so you, you're positing that you can, I mean, in, in practical mathematics, people, you know, practical mathematicians work only with these high level constructs. They don't work at the level of the, you know, the sand of, of the axioms and, and all that kind of thing. Right. Um, and, you know, a question would be, how should we think about, well, okay, here's another, another view of this. So in Metamath, you know, I think uh, you guys are, uh, have built, you know, a big library of, of what, hundreds of thousands of, of statements of mathematics, basically, represented in the syntax of Metamath. Now, the question would be, so here's, here's a basic question. You can think of all those statements, and you can imagine that the definitions that go into those statements knit those statements together. That is, there's a, in a sense, there's a giant hypergraph that represents all of those statements in which every time a plus appears in any statement, it's the same, it is, it is the same node of the hypergraph as the plus appearing in some other statement. So in other words, the statements are like the hyper edges of a giant hypergraph. Does that, does that picture make some sense or? Um, so, I mean, in other words, you're saying, take, take all the statements of, take all the statements that you've written down for Metamath. Each one of those is like a hyper edge that connects certain definitions. Or is that a crazy way to think about it? No, I, well, I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, no, it, go ahead. It's, no. you're, you're connecting um, multiple, I mean, every usage of a theorem is connecting, I guess, the the truth of the things that you're proving it to the truth of the theorem. And so you end up with a graph of connections between theorems. Um, I, I'm, I'm describing two different graphs. Okay, so mm -hmm. one is a proof graph and you're right that theorems are connected by one is proved from another. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And I mean, I hate to sound physics like about it, but that's, that's in our models of physics, that's some kind of multi-way graph that represents the time evolution of the universe. And all the different possible proofs are all the different part, possible paths of quantum mechanics. But that's, so that's one kind of thing is the kind of time evolution of, you know, given this statement, you can derive another statement. That's like kind of the, the evolution of, 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 the, of physics through time. But another thing is to take a slice through that to say at some moment, so we started from the mathematical big bang, but we started from this collection of axioms and we just proved, 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 proved a bunch of things from it. That generates a graph. Now we say, let's take a slice through that graph at a particular moment in time. We stop mathematics in the year 2021 when a certain amount has been proved. And now we ask the question, in that slice of this proof graph in 2021, what does that slice of proof graph, what is it like? And that slice of proof graph, every node in that uh, proof graph is a statement. And so now what I'm asking is, how are those statements knitted together? I would say that that's a sort of an intensely sociological statement. So um, the the mathematics that exists in a theorem prover, if you just look at all of the all of the the theorems in you know in Mathlib or all of the theorems in in uh, in Metamath, uh, those are all based on what people were interested to to talk about, right? So. Yeah. Uh, l like the real numbers, the real numbers are very sort of, uh, in, in some ways, they're a very contrived construct, right? It's, it's, it's some, uh, we, we have some intuitions from, from, uh, from the physical world about how, how, you know, smoothness works. And, and we sort of back form this idea of like, mm, we need something that has this property of like divisibility and, and uh, has these, these field axioms and so on. And we, we eventually crystallize this concept of, oh, this isn't like a, a complete ordered field. And then uh, ZFC says, ah, I can build complete ordered fields. Here's a very contrived way to construct one. And it's like, okay, that's great. Let's put that away and never think about it again. Um, so I, I would say that, that the, the, the path that takes us to the real numbers is in some ways very much, it's, it's like engineering, right? We, we say, okay, we want this thing. How do we get here? Um, so it's not so much that we just like randomly explored the graph and found all sorts of interesting statements. Like that's what, that's what you would do if you just, you know, started uh, putting, putting theorems together in a computer without, without regard for, you know, what, what sticks on what you would have an intense explosion, you know, I lost you again.
everything, uh, the, the, the fully uninteresting statement. And then the question of which of those statements are interesting is, uh, is really hard and basically depends on lots of contingent human factors. Um, I mean, well, the, like the time evolution that you're talking about, I, I think the best way to look at it is the actual physical time evolution of these databases. You would see uh, the, how does the number of statements and, and the actual content of statements of the, the formal library change from this year, or last year, the year before that, you know, how are things developing? Um, and that you're going to see, ah, this is a hot area of mathematics, or this is an area where that guy happens to be working, and he's interested in those things. And so that's why we have a bunch of new theorems in that area. Okay, but so, so one way to think about this is it's geography versus the theory of space. In other words, we could, or geography versus geodesy. You know, we're looking at the surface of the Earth, and it has its spherical. You know, it, it's, um, but there's also the where do people build cities? And, you know, people build cities in random places, and there's a certain amount we can deduce about the geodetic structure of the Earth by just looking at what cities people have built. And there's other things which are the underlying geodesy of the Earth that we maybe could, could have a theory about even before we ask about the geography of where people build cities. And you know, I think this is the question of whether, I mean, this is a very basic question about the foundations of mathematics. To what extent it's geography, to what extent it's geodesy, so to speak. Is there a geodetic foundation? Is there something about the geodesy of mathematics that's significant, independent of its human geography, so to speak? Or is it, is mathematics, I mean, this is sort of the, the Plato versus, versus Hilbert versus whatever story of, you know, what, what is the, you know, is mathematics just, you throw down the axioms and then this is what grows from them and the aliens could have thrown down another set of axioms or is there something inexorable about the structure of mathematics that would be that, and we keep on, you know, I think we're looping around a couple of different issues here because we're saying both, Principle of computational equivalence type ideas tell us it sort of doesn't matter much what the underlying axioms are. Now we're saying, but the thing we build is a bit human and geographical, but is that really true? Or is there something, you know, is, is it true that there is some contingent history associated with what get, gets built, but there is a geodetic level that is, okay, so let's take the fluid dynamics example. You could say it's all hopeless, it matters what the underlying molecular structure is. There's no bulk theory of a fluid. It's just like, it's gonna depend on which particular molecules you threw in there. And that particular fluid is gonna make this pattern because those are the molecules you threw in there. Or these are the molecular interactions you threw in there. Um, but in fact, there is a theory. There is a bulk theory of fluids that isn't just you know, work out the molecular dynamics. And so the question would be, what, what would that bulk theory look like for mathematics? Is there such a theory? And, or is it the case that mathematics is merely a, um, uh, you know, it, it's, um, I mean, this, this is a question I'm, I'm sort of trying to, trying to, mm -hmm. trying to think about, and, and I'm trying to understand what, what kind of empirical data do we have? So, so my view of it would be, I mean, physicalizing it, so to speak, the proof graph, is the time history of the universe, which is played out by mathematicians doing proofs. Now, now notice what's interesting is there is, a, there is an ultimate proof graph, which is the set of all possible proofs that can be made. Mathematicians will only have actually filled in some limited part of that proof graph, but there is an ultimate proof graph, which is the set of all proofs mathematicians could make. Now we can take a time slice of the proof graph the, the results mathematicians got to. And, and obviously there are different reference frames we can pick. We can, we can choose to evolve the proof graph further in this area because people were really enthusiastic about algebraic geometry at this period of time or something like that. But ultimately there is a proof graph, which is the inexorable ultimate proof graph. Human mathematicians may have explored only in, in some particular sort of uh, craggy way that, that frontier of the proof graph. But now what I'm asking is, if you look at that craggy frontier and you simply look at all the statements that you know that people have put into metamath, what is the structure of what we would think of as the analog of physical space that exists at a particular moment in time? So in other words, if we imagine that metamath has 
you know, we, we imagine we just pick up all these, the, the, we think of these statements as being like points in space. And what we're talking about is kind of what is the connectivity of those points in space? What is the space of mathematical statements? So for example, a distance metric, we can imagine a distance metric on mathematical statements that we would derive from this giant hypergraph that is the representation of how all these different, you know, statements in, in Metamath weave together. I, I'm, I'm curious whether you have a, a thought about that um, uh, kind of uh, point well, of view. I, and I, I, I would say that that um, for f to f you know first approximation, uh, formal mathematics is is subservient to informal mathematics in the sense that uh, what gets formalized is the mathematics that for the most part already exists. Uh, the, the mathematics that is, that is being done in traditional mathematics departments. And so if you want to understand, you know, how does the mathematics evolve uh, formally, you should look at how does the mathematics involve, uh, evolve informally. I mean, to some extent, it's actually a little bit misleading to look at. They lost you again. Now I'm trying to make a correlation between the, the, uh, the person is walking in and out every, every time I think somebody ah, else is yes, like sorry. downloading giant pieces of software or something on your network. <laughs> and that's, that's every time that happens, uh, your audio drops out. But you, you were going to say the informal, uh, look, I mean, uh, a, a very practical question is, you know, like our Wolfram language system, Mathematica, et cetera, gets used by zillions of people to actually compute things in mathematics. One of the things that we're interested in is how should that system interact with the kind of world of, of, of proofs and proof representations and things like metamath? And what's the, you know, and you're describing in a sense, in Mathematica, we are doing formalized informal mathematics in the sense that the functions we've defined are functions that have historically been found useful. You know, I see my role as a language designer being to crystallize the things that people typically find useful, give them names, implement them, right? So we've got sort of formalized informal mathematics, different from the, the uh, you know, the metamath story, which is, I mean, in a sense, our underlying language, our transformation rules for symbolic expressions, that's more analogous to the kind of thing you're seeing in metamath, but we've built this huge sort of, uh, you know, language of, of, you know, in a sense, that would be like the raw, syntax of English or something without any words that mean anything. But we built a bunch of words that mean things. Okay, so the question is, uh, and we've also got this particular workflow, which says you feed in an input, we crunch, 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 and find a, evaluate to a fixed point and say, there's your answer. Okay, and, and so the question would be, what kind of thing, so, so one thing that we have thought about and we've done a certain amount of work on is, here's your answer, and here's how we got there. Here's the proof, proof graph, basically, that got you there. Because normally, in the operation of our system, we don't, nobody really cares about that. I mean, to me, and I, I'm curious about your, your guys' experience with this. I mean, to me, what I'm seeing is there are a small subset of mathematicians who care about formalized proofs. There are more people in, uh, in sort of uh, validation, software validation, who care about this kind of thing. There are plenty of aspirational examples, for example, in blockchain, there are plenty of aspirational examples where people say, if only we could do formal verification, we would, you know, and actually provide a proof, we'd be very happy, but we've never been able to do that. Same with protocols, lots of kinds of things like that. So I'm curious, you know, I, I'm just curious, actually, whether you see the application of this kind of thing as being actually to mathematics or to things that are more like uh, things like blockchain or protocols or things like this. I mean, who wants proofs is basically my question. I, uh, personally, I'm interested in both sides of that question. I'm interested in, in, in helping mathematicians to write write. Uh, proofs, uh, and I'm also interested in doing, you know, formal software verification stuff, um, and that's sort of been been the 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 story of of my my you know career PhD is is uh, moving you know between these two realms where you really want you want to be able to help 
practicing mathematician, do mathematics research and so on inside a formal proof assistant. Um, and then you also want to help people who are trying to write programs that don't cause, you know, errors that, that leak secrets to to people that that cause real harm, right? That that's that's the sort of thing that that um, that formal uh, formal mathematics has to offer um, to to very practical concerns. Um, I think the main challenge, though, in, in software verification is is the the long arm of computational irreducibility slash undecidability and so on reaches out very quickly. You know, in other words, any program that is doing something non-trivial is almost by definition unverifiable. In other words, as soon as it's doing something that has the that is really I, making use of irreducible computation, it will not be possible. I disagree on that point. Okay, I disagree on that point. So, uh, it, any any program that we write, well, almost any program that we write, we will write, we will engineer to be correct for a reason, right? We have some reason that we wrote those lines and those orders to do those things. The idea was that it was trying to do something. And if we internalize, if we formally define and, and write down what it is that people were thinking, why what they thought that that program you, was you correct, are we get the proof. You're about to slide well, into so a paradox. Well, so the thing is, the thing is everything interesting in mathematics is undecidable. Like that's just, you know, all no, of no, but, all but, of the, the all the of the paradox, interesting questions are undecidable, but, but we can decide them because they were supposed into. to be true. Look, the paradox uh -huh. you just slid into was the following thing: you say the programmer had an idea in their head when they wrote this program. You say, let's capture that idea and see if the program does what the programmer thought it should do. But if you have a well-designed language for expressing what the programmer thought it should do. You just have used that to write the program. Now, what you mm -hmm. could say is, this is what the programmer thought it should do. So in other words, it, you know, a, lot of, a lot of kind of confusion about verification came from people saying, oh, we wrote this program in low level language X. Let's now write the thing at a higher level in, um, uh, you know, in this higher level verification language that is going to do the same thing as the low level thing but at a higher level, so we understand it better. You know, having spent my last 40 years doing language design, I like to think that we are cap, you know, we've got a language where people can actually understand what they're doing. But I think the second thing you might be saying is, once you have the answer, then, then the question would be, um, what, um, uh, I think something went wrong with our, our Zoom session here. If somebody can uh -huh. fix that. Um, the, uh, uh, what um, um, once you have the answer, maybe it has to, maybe it's supposed to have certain properties that were not the description of how to make it. But it, it's kind of like in physics, you can say, here's how this thing moves. It follows this equation of motion. The other way to say it is the thing satisfies the principle of least action. Mm -hmm. Those might be equivalent statements, but it might be useful to say, there's this constraint the thing has to satisfy, and that might or might not be. So you could say, here's this thing I'm building without my program. Here's a constraint. Now I can say for my proof system, does, does my program verify that constraint? Does my, does my program satisfy that constraint? So I, I suppose maybe that's, maybe that's what you're saying. Maybe I am. Well, I, um, I, I, I think that if, if it's supposed to be true, then it should be true for a reason. And if it wasn't true for any particular reason that the person, the author was able to understand, then, well, either we're doing some kind of experimental mathematics where we don't actually understand the programs we're talking about, uh, or uh, you just wrote a bug and, and you need to redesign your program. So I would say, you know, we really need to design our languages so that they can specify, so that you can write in a, you can actually specify formally what what properties you want this thing to satisfy, and such that it can check that those things are true. Um, I think that the, the current programming languages are lacking in this regard. Uh, right, but the problem is you will never be able to state it's it's a Gödel's theorem story. You know, you say my program is going to make just uh, the integers and nothing but the integers. Now I'm going to give a bunch of constraints that guarantee my program is going to give just the integers and nothing but the integers. Well, sorry, you can't do that. 
It doesn't, as soon as you have something as rich as the integers, there's no way to do that. And I think that's the problem is that it is the uh, case when you- I'm sorry, you, you cut out there, uh, or I, I missed. Okay. Uh, what was it about the integers? So I, I said, if, you are, if you're a programmer and you're writing a program that's gonna make the integers are nothing but the integers, we know from Gödel's theorem that that's not something where you can give a finite set of constraints that will guarantee to give you. So in the mind of the programmer, the programmer is thinking about integers and says, I want integers and nothing but integers. But the problem is there isn't a finite way to get just the integers and nothing but the integers. In fact, our very notion of the integers is which we think we have as a mental construct doesn't really work as there isn't a sort of finite way to box in just that concept. I mean, what, what I think is the case- Well, ZFC uh, is a finite theory. Like yes. you can define the integers in ZFC. So, I mean, uh, the, the idea that the way that you get around this is that you have a formal theory in the background. That formal theory is a very finite object. It's got some, some axioms and some rules of substitution and so on. And those axioms, you can use them in order to define and prove the property that you're interested in. And it's in this case that your program only produces integers. Well, okay, so, so the, you know, one point of view, one practical point of view will be to say, as you write your code, you imagine there are certain constraints your code should satisfy. Put those constraints into the code you're writing, right? Say, and in a sense, when like, for example, we're in the process of building a very elaborate compilation system for Wolfram language, okay? That compilation system requires certain assumptions to be made. It requires essentially a type framework where you're assuming certain things about, um, you know, that, that at this moment, this thing you've got has to be a list of integers, things like that. So in a sense, the programmer by specifying types there is giving a bunch of constraints, which we can in principle formally verify. And we actually have built a bunch of, a, a big system for doing this, for doing the type calculus, so to speak, and trying to work through you know, is this going to generate this thing versus that thing? So in some sense, however, however, so, so in other words, free form programming, which is what people normally do in Wolfram language, doesn't, it's just, it's expressions, you can do whatever you want with them. And sometimes they'll do things you don't expect. And so the other approach to programming is the, let me program only as far as I can sort of put constraints around what's going to happen. In the end, if you want your program to do anything where you allow the computer to really do something for you, you will not be able to put constraints on everything that happens. You'll be able to put a limited set of constraints. You can have guardrails that prevent you from, you know, doing, driving completely off the road and, and, you know, crashing your program or something perhaps, but you can't have, if you knew how to make constraints that would guide you to the answer, then the com computation wouldn't be worth doing. In other words, you, you and so, my, you know, I think that what is the case is that to put in certain kinds of, and here we want to make sure that this property is valid for the results of our program, that makes sense to then be able to formally verify, actually you can throw away that check in the program. You could, in a, in a sense, okay, one way to think about it is in terms of program simplification. Let's say I have a program, we have now a framework, the confirm and close framework for Wolfram language, which is a generalized exception handling framework, okay? So a typical thing you do is inside a piece of code, you say confirm something. So confirm in this piece of code, an expression, confirm that expression has certain properties, okay? If it doesn't, it essentially generates an exception and goes to some, some enclosing in close, okay? So what, what you could do is you could say, the objective of our system is to remove confirms. How? by verifying that the, you just don't need it. You just don't need to run that code because there's a theorem that says it will always work. And so to me, that would be a concrete, you know, you could imagine uh, the following sort of actual practical workflow. You could imagine spraying confirms all over your code. You could imagine having confirmation engineers, so to speak, who say, I'm gonna interview the programmer. I'm gonna say, what properties do you think the program should have had at that point? They're gonna say this and this and this, you're gonna spray those confirms in there. And then your verifier is gonna come through and say, actually that's all unnecessary because I can formally verify that you don't need that condition. 
I mean, that would that to me is a that's a meaningful workflow. I mean, that that's a now that doesn't sign up for something that I think you think you want to sign up for, but I think is impossible, which is to say box in everything that's in the mind of the programmer. Because I think the only way you express what's in the mind of the programmer is with a language. And that language, you know, I think there's there's I think you maybe people have the the thought that somehow you're going to be able to capture the whole story of what's inside the mind of the programmer. And I don't think you can you can do that. In other words, well, I don't need the whole story. I just need the part of it that contributes to the correctness of the program. What does correctness mean? The the final specification, the program, the program has some some constraints on it. It's supposed to be doing something. OK, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Those are two different statements. The program is supposed to be doing something and the program has constraints on it. Those are two different statements. Uh -huh. The program can have a constraint that says, don't crash, don't scribble on memory. OK, those are constraints. The program might be computing the next great, you know, such and such kind of number. OK, mm -hmm. the I claim that the constraints, yes, given a coarse set of guardrail constraints, you can absolutely capture those. But the claim that you can capture what the program is trying to do, I think the only way you get to capture what the program is trying to do is by looking at the program itself. I think that anything else is, is, is kind of, you know, you're saying basically, in other words, the program is its description. And you can say, I don't like that language that it's described in, I want a different language. But in the end, the program is its description. And as a human, you know, the role of the language designer is to do the best job you can of translating human thoughts into something representable in a computational language. I mean, that's what I see as my, my role in, in doing language design is, is that process. And then, you know, it, it's, as I said, I think the program is the description of what you're trying to do. Now, you know, the quality assurance, the guardrails, I think that a very reasonable objective for proof assistant, well, a very reasonable objective for automated theorem proving, proof assistant type things and so on, is to say, uh, you know, don't worry about this guardrail. I can verify that your program will never hit it. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a completely valid, you know, it's, it's like, you know, don't worry about the double spend problem for this cryptocurrency. It can never happen. Um, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable objective. Now, I mean, if we pull that back to mathematics and we ask, I mean, that's a very different type of objective than mathematicians, I think, typically have, I think. I mean, well, that, there, that... so there, there's one, one, one small part that I want to add to, to your, your, your picture there, which is you say. We lost you again. You know. Uh, yeah, so you say that, that you add these confirms to each uh, statement. Um, and uh, what I would add is the ability to add as proof. Uh, those are those confirms, those are theorem statements, right? And we know that, that verifying theorem statements in general is undecidable. Um, so what, what can we do? Well, we can add a language for proofs where we, we specify in those confirms, not only what is it that it sh that should be true, but also why is it true, um, and that gets around the undecidability issue. Um, it will limit your ability to uh, add confirms for arbitrary things to only things where the confirm is actually something that can be proven. Um, but okay, that's so that, generally going to be the case. That's an interesting workflow. So your workflow in that case is what a programmer does. What a proof programmer does mm -hmm. is they write the code, the code contains a confirm, the confirm contains the proof that the confirm is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, a, so that's a type of program which is a little different from the types of programs we're used to, because most types mm -hmm. of programs is just the computer runs it and it's happy. Um, right. what, what you're saying is the program is for exhibition. Part of the program is for exhibition only, so to speak. That is by which I mean, it says, here's my program and here I've got a proof in my program, which yes, I could go and automatically verify the proof. But you know, the main thing is I'm exhibiting the proof. The proof is not relevant to the execution of the program. The proof is 
for exhibition only, so to speak. Well, it's it's not only for exhibition. And in fact, I would say that it's not primarily for exhibition. I would say that its primary purpose is as input to the compiler. Um, so uh, the compiler is basically going to be essentially, this is like a type We lost you again. Check. So uh, a, a, a compiler can, uh, in, in normal programming languages, a compiler will have, have types on variables. And when you write the wrong type, it gives an error. Well, what if you write the wrong proof, it gives an error. And then if you uh, don't write the wrong proof, if you write all the, all the correct proofs, and, and then it has additional information, it can use that information to optimize the program better, right? So I think that's a, you're, you're making some big steps there. I mean, uh -huh. in other words, the, the first statement is you can't verify everything. You're going to have a limited set of confirms. Fine. OK, now you say now let's put the proofs into the confirms. A fine idea. Now you're making another statement, which is and that can be used to help the compiler. Now, by the way, why do we even need a compiler? I mean, that is we need a compiler because we are turning our beautiful high level computational language into that ugly thing that is what the hardware, I have friends who design uh, uh, instruction sets for hardware, they're not, they're, not, they're not supposed to be that ugly, but you know, I'm turning this into that thing that um, uh, is the actual you know, thing that is implemented by the hardware. Right. And, that's, that's, uh, and you're saying that it is easier to do that, it's easier to make those program transformations that, that the, uh, is not a self-evidently obvious thing that having that proof makes it easier to do program transformations. It might be true. No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make it easier to do the program transformations. Uh, it, it does allow you to uh, make better program transformations in some cases. For instance, you can have asserts that don't need to run, right? That's, that's a concept that just doesn't exist in normal programming languages. If you write an assert, you either have to run it or you don't actually get the benefits of Absolutely. the assert. Absolutely. So I agree with that case. As I was saying, you can remove confirms. You can mm -hmm. prove that you can remove a confirm. Now tell me something else you can do with that proof. In other words, you can... You can um, um, I think Maria, see, see, the real thing uh -huh. is between Zoom and all the other different pieces of technology we're using, uh -huh. the question is, is there a proof that no packet can ever not arrive? And, um, and apparently, <laughs> apparently there isn't. I, I, I believe there are some packets that, that are, yeah, there's a counterexample, I'm sure. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Right. So, so um, uh, oh, fair enough. I, I, I'm sort of curious in the, I mean, just going back to what is mathematics and so on. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the one question is, okay, so we, we've talked a little bit and that was actually helpful, at least to me, to understand a little bit more about what, how one thinks about the workflows that one can use a proof assistant for in software engineering, so to speak. I'm, I'm, I mean, this question of how much you can use it, how much you can use the innards of the proof to help with compilation, I'm not sure about that. And that, that seems like an interesting question to, to investigate. But so I understand that concept will workflow for using proof assistance in software engineering. Let's, let's go back to the mathematical case. And I guess my question, the thing that I'm still, um, the, uh, um, it's, um, uh, uh, it's kind of um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the thing that, that I'm, let's see, you, you're saying, you should mention that you're writing uh, MathMath <laughs> Zero, which which does all these things. Cool. Yes. <laughs> well, so so I'm I'm uh, th this concept of having a compiler that that will actually make use of proofs. This is this is uh, like I said, I, I find this lacking in in existing languages, uh, and so uh, the obvious solution to that is to uh, write my own. Um, so absolutely, have, that's, that's it, the right. You have answer. exactly any this, such, right? Any such that doesn't exist <laughs> elsewhere is right your own. The, I right. I fully support that. But but my question here would be: when I give type specifications, okay, I'm basically the one difference between. So so in our, it's actually interesting what you're saying. Okay, so so in our compiler, okay, that we've been is a long running project to, to make a fairly complete compiler for Wolfram language, which is incredibly hard because it's a, a complicated symbolic language, right? So one of the things that I've actually been pushing for is the following thing. 
Okay, so U is essentially a proof assistant approach to type specifications in compilable code. So in other words, I've got a piece of code, it runs just fine in the, it's not a pure interpreter that we have, but it's the, you know, in the standard evaluator, it runs just fine. Then I say, actually, I want to turn it into low level machine code type stuff. I need to, I need to have, I need to give type specifications because that's what I need in order to turn it into low level machine code. Okay, so now I can say, well, I'm gonna specify this type here, but then the, the, I mean, we've run into exactly this problem that our type prover can't determine the type of this particular thing inside here. In other words, we know that these components have this type. What is the type of this other thing? Okay. And the answer is we can't determine that. Uh, you know, our proof system is not strong enough to determine what that type is. In fact, there may not even be an answer from the proof system. It may be we're taking a square root. And usually in the mind of the programmer, that's gonna be a real number, but by golly, it could be a complex number in some cases, but we actually don't care about that. We're perfectly happy to have our program just raise an exception if it's a complex number. So the thing I've been pushing for is that we have a user interaction mechanism that is like a proof assistant, which says, here's your program. In order to compile this program, we need to know what the type of this thing here is, okay? the program as you have written it does not determine that type. Write essentially, you know, add proof assistant like steps that tell, you know, that say what type you want to assume and that then verify that there is you no, know, not an inconsistency in, in specifying this type here and that type there. So I think that's, I mean, I, you know, I, I think that's actually yeah. a very powerful potential thing. I have to say, I've had a bit of a hard time. Maybe there's some people on this, on this call have been involved in this. I, yeah. I had a bit of a hard time convincing our team that this makes sense. Um, so, so typing in general takes you, like it, it, if you really want to be precise about it, um, typing you know, gets you into these, these proofs very directly, right? A, t a type checker is really nothing more than a very simplified proof assistant it, it, or, or an automated theorem prover really. Um, and and you have this example with the square root. You know, you could you could if you suppose you have a square root and you want it to actually be a real, but the actual, <laughs> let's just say that the the underlying you know the 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 instruction, the the is actually going to produce a complex number if you don't give it a non-negative input. Um, so then, well, that means that the input to this function is not a real number. It's a real number uh, which is greater than or equal to zero. So now we need the ability to say, ah, this, is, this isn't this is just a real number. This is a real number that's greater or equal to zero. And then when you have something that, oh, I added two things that were, you know, oh, this one is, this one, they're both greater or equal to zero, or this one's greater than negative one, and that one's greater than positive one, and therefore their sum is greater than zero, right? You know, you, you start, you get these, you get dependent types basically, um, in order to specify the 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 properties of the inputs um, that are going around. Um, well, I think so. One... It's it's yeah. really a short jump from there to actual proving. Uh, right, and I suppose one thing that's interesting your... that you're claiming from met the metamath experience is this notion of a limited set of provisos that you can handle symbolically, so to speak. That is, those are essentially dependent types that you're handling symbolically. I mean, normally, as you, when you get into dependent types, you know, it's everything's undecidable and flapping around horribly. But but you're saying mm -hmm. there's a particular slice of dependent types that you're using in MetaMath that remain symbolically, uh, you know, for which there is a symbolic calculus effectively to to deal with them. And so, well, there, there's there's something to to distinguish here, which is that type checking is is automated theorem proving that is undecidable in general mm -hmm. if you want the full you know glory of mathematics um but proof verification is very much decidable right absolutely metamath does proof verification and it does it very well uh and the idea here is that if you give in the programming language the ability to specify proofs then you can get around the problem that everything interesting is undecidable right 
the the you're you're using you can use the pro the the computer to do proof search in certain limited domains if you want to but if for whatever reason it can't find it or it takes too long or it's just you know running away forever then you can just specify the proof well right? what you're saying is uh, i mean let's be realistic what you're saying is you can only run as far as you can prove and mm -hmm. that yeah. is that means there are many things you can't do there are many things you can't compute because you can't prove them. But so you're saying, as a human using this, you can only do things you can prove. Don't, don't overdrive mm. your proof capability. And that is a very limited programming language, but nevertheless, one... N not, not necessarily. So, so there, there's an easy way to, to uh, be able to run things that you can't prove, which is to not claim properties of them, right? So... If and that's basically what okay. traditional programming languages do. It... We lost you again. Is... I'm telling you, I want to see uh... the verification of packet of zero packet loss. <laughs> um... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you you can say that it's it's an int, but it's not an int from three to seven. This is easy because uh, you know addition, uh, especially addition modulo sixty two to the sixty four, is a, you know it's a it's a processor instruction, and it's super easy to prove that this thing is closed under that operation. So we have some fixed number of proofs, and then we have a, a very small number of types, and this is some some very basic kind of of proof about our our program. And then if that's all we care about, then it's like, okay, we have a program that computes something. And then let's just run it and find out what it computes and do some experimental okay, mathematics fine. on if, it. If you're, if you're prepared to do that, then, you know, I agree. Look, I think as a practical matter, I mean, and you know, I, the, the, um, uh, the thing, what you're saying supports what I've been claiming for a while now, which is a real use of proof assistant methodology is providing essentially guiding a compiler to the point where it can actually compile something. Because one of the things that happens with our compiler right now, uh, you know, is basically it takes a babysitter. Well, it, it always takes a babysitter to get a complicated program to compile because there are things that the type automated theorem prover cannot prove, right? And they may not even be true because it may be the case that the thing can run off into all kinds of directions, which the programmer doesn't care about, but which are formally possible, right? All kinds of, of, um, uh, of rabbit holes that it can, it can run down. So what I've been pushing for is something where it is an interactive process with the programmer, where you're basically seeing pieces of your code and they're, they're read until you say, I'm gonna add this piece of poking to that piece of code that's gonna be an extra, an extra wrapper around it that says, I'm just gonna assume that this is of a given type. And then, then eventually you'll see the thing turn green and, and then you can run it. I mean, I think, that's a, I think that's a very realistic workflow that's very interesting and where whether those proofs are given as, as you make, you know, the role of the human there is to make assumptions that can then allow an automated theorem prover to go further. And that's a little different than the role of the human is to actually give every step in the proof, but it's something that is sort of in the same workflow direction, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, yeah. I think that's a really interesting thing. And I'm- And, I'm and you can always, you can, you can mix it up, right? You, you don't have to have all automated. Um, there, there are some systems which are just all automated, uh, like the, the Daphne language, is uh, it's sort of C-like, but you can put assertions in and it uses a SAT solver uh, or SMT solver to be able to solve those assertions um, and, and prove them correct. But then you have these issues with like, oh, if the proof gets too complicated, then it starts to slow down and the compilation gets really slow. Um, so, uh, but you can still like partially specify the proof and then solve the rest or have more intermediate assertions and so on. So I think that, that ATPs, you know, automated theorem provers, interactive theorem provers, they, they integrate very well. Um, you don't have to specify every single step. Sure. Um, Metamath is sort of an archival format where it's really focused on having every single step. And if you had a Metamath, basically you can imagine uh, a compiler for this, this hypothetical proof code language that would compile down to, let's say, um, some, some, uh, uh, some some machine code plus some metamath 
and the metamath would be proving the correctness of machine code. Um, yeah, so that, I understand it. Yeah. I mean, look, I think my takeaway from that is one of the things about the metamath language is essentially the um, uh, you know manipulation and calculus on patterns, which is something that um, uh, you know I think that's a that's a difference between the kind of thing that we're doing with with uh, transformation rules on symbolic expressions, and that's that's something to look at. So we, we should wrap soon here. But but um, uh, I, I guess I'd be curious to ask Norm here. Who, I'm sorry, you seem to have been left out in this. The um, it, it's um, so you know we had started at the beginning here with the how did how did MetaMath the system come to exist? And you were saying. You know, I have to say, I think Principia Mathematica, the Whitehead Russell document, has has launched so many ships, so to speak, in the in the Troy sense. I mean, it you know the thing itself, I always thought was just crazy, and you know the actual the actual you know thing that Whitehead and Russell produced has always struck me as being mostly a show off kind of thing, and and. Um, but but it's launched so many different things, and it sounds like it launched your your enterprise as well. Um, and um, but so I'm I'm curious in in as you built out. I mean, actually, I have no idea. I mean, is this is 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 MetaMath like what you do for a living, or is this is this something? Is this are you like some of the rest of us, kind of hobbyist, um, uh, uh, you know, hobbyist science, so to speak? No, MetaMath is purely a hobby. It is not, I've never done anything related to it for a living. So, um, so it's okay. just, you know, I mean, it, it like motivates me once I get, got started on it and started to see some results come up in set theory and early set theory, I just kept going and going. I said, you know, it, it kind of amazed me that here we could do a complete formal proof of this thing that's only described vaguely in textbooks. And it just gave me a feeling that I really understood it. Whereas before, I, yeah, I sort of understood it, but you know, is there something that I sort of missed, a little gap in the proof? That, so, you know, it served a lot for my own personal uh, education in mathematics. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges, and this is the sort of the difference between the proof assistant and the automated theorem prover, you know, there's this thing like, you know, I found this, the minimal axiom system for Boolean mm -hmm. algebra in terms of NANDs mm -hmm. in 2000 or so. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun result and its proof is incomprehensible. And mm -hmm. its proof was found, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it remains the only example of a, an unexpected result found by automated theorem proving. So I think, I think all other, you mm -hmm. know, I think Maria was talking about the informal mathematics versus formalized mathematics. This was a case where I think, it's, I think it, it remains the only example where one went from, from the formal to actually discover something of informal interest, so to speak. Mm -hmm. but, but in any case, the, the thing about that that's been perhaps interesting, perhaps frustrating, I think we, we corresponding a little bit about, about this is that proof is incomprehensible. And you know, I made some efforts to try to understand it. Uh, you know, what is the transformation from the automated proof? You know, what does it feel like to go from an automated proof, or is it even a thing worth thinking about, to a human sort of uh, sort of interactive proof, so to speak? Is that a well? In the MetaMath case, um, we document the, each theorem, each little theorem and lemma, pretty carefully. So just by reading the comments, a person can understand what the function of this is. Now, just reading the MetaMath code itself, uh, I, I don't think is all that instructive all the time. You need the comment to help you understand what is the purpose of this. Now, in terms of your example, another example is um, the proof that every, I think every Robbins algebra is a Boolean algebra. Uh, that was found by McCune with his EQP prover. Uh, right. That was um, a conjecture for many, many years. Right. See, but that's not the, 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 the difference between that and what I was doing is everybody thought the Robbins conjecture was true, right? That had already been, you know, that was already, but nobody thought there was a, a simple axiom system for, you know, the, the, the things that people like Meredith had found for 
you know, for NAND-based schooling algebra, they were huge. I mean, they're huge compared to what I found. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there was something that simple that could give you Boolean algebra was kind of surprising. And, you know, that's a case, I mean, I'm not, a, a, you know, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just a user of tools and a builder of tools. And, and it, it, it kind of, for me, it was, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not, um, I think it's, it's interesting when you can find unexpected things by using sort of uh, uh, in these kind of, you know, building from the molecular dynamics up, mm -hmm. so to speak. And it's surprising how rarely that's been done in mathematics. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the reason is people haven't formulated those questions. Perhaps the reason is the number of things that you hit that people care about by doing purely formalized things isn't so large. I don't yeah. know. Well, in the Robbins algebra case, um, the proof was sort of incomprehensible at first. And just because I guess it was, it was perceived importance uh, several people had gone through it and they identified that most of it was pretty routine stuff, except for this one step that nobody would have ever thought of that was completely non-intuitive. And um, I, in fact, um, well, I, I had asked a couple of people to look at your proof um, uh -huh. and neither of them have come up with anything. So I think you know, they may have given up. But I was I actually okay, I want, start I, looking at it myself. Be able to do that. What's that? I was going to look at it myself. Um, that would be wonderful. To, I mean, listen, I'd be really interested to know, is the automated theorem prover doing something clever? Or is mm -hmm. it just being, you know, is it, you know I, I didn't know this thing about the Robbins proof. And that's interesting to hear that, um, that most of it is just bureaucracy, but there's one clever mm -hmm. idea type. Right. Thing, what you're basically saying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wonder what on earth is going on in, in the. So, in, in your right? proof, maybe there's something similar. Maybe it's a whole bunch of non-intuitive, clever Who ideas. Knows? Who right. knows, right? So, some. Yeah, I'm. I would be interested in seeing that. You know, in fact, you know, one idea I had is simply do it and meta convert it to metamath, where I can play with pieces, and maybe correct. come up with lemmas and you know tie things together. You know, so the I thing don't know. Was we'll see. Disappointing to me was I started trying to go through the thing. Mm -hmm. And I got stuck at about lemma number three, where it took me 15 minutes to understand what on earth this thing was doing, because it's, you know, it's substituting things in, you know, this way and that way. Now, I'm not very good at these kinds of things personally. So I'm not, you know, that's kind of why I build computer tools to do these things is because I, mm -hmm. that way I don't have to do them myself. Um, so I'm not the best sample of that, but a, a few other people had looked at some of these. And, yeah. and again, it was, it was, it was difficult to understand. And I'm, I'm surprised I mean, another thing is we've now got, okay, so some recent work we've done um, in connection with our physics project, actually, on the simplification of quantum circuits has led to some ideas about proof-to-proof -proof transformation, where we're basically taking a proof and applying transformations to the proof. So in the kind of, I don't know, homotopy type theory type world of, you know, you've got these different proof paths. And the question is, can you deform one proof path into another proof path? Mm -hmm. And so there may be some other approach where we can say, let's just take that proof and try and automatically simplify it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I, I wonder in, in Metamath, um, do, do you in fact have many people where they have taken a proof and transformed into, into another proof? I mean, in other words, taking, or is it that most people will take a proof and I'm gonna prove this thing and I'm going to find this proof path, or is there a proof-to-proof -proof transformation kind of uh, activity that goes on? That must be possible to do proof-to-proof. -proof. Yeah, people get hints from other proofs. I mean, just as a mathematician would, there are techniques that you use uh, for proving things that are used a lot. And, you know, people who do metamath proofs have most likely studied a lot of other metamath proofs till they sort of get the... But, but what know, about the, the meta-metamath thing? So in other words, you've got a metamath proof, mm -hmm. and now you want to apply metamath transformations to the proof to get another proof. Does the, uh, does the system I, this allow is a, that? This is definitely a thing. So th I would say that this is something that the metamath does more than other proof languages, uh, which is uh, basically uh, we have, because we archive proofs, we don't archive proof scripts. Um, there's really a meaningful question of, can you optimize this proof? Can you make it, can you do the same thing, but faster? Can you do the same thing, but with less words? Um, 
And you know, there are local transformations you can do that, that will uh, optimize uh, a proof. For instance, uh, if you apply a theorem whose proof is the composition of two other theorems, then, or, or the other way around, if, if you have two theorems and it turns out there's another theorem that's basically just those compositions, then you can just insert it there. Um, and so you can do like a, an analysis of, of the whole library, try to find like, ah, here's a place where you could be using that other theorem. And hey, look, it got two two characters shorter. And, and, uh, the, and, and Metamath actually it does that like there's sort of like a running project of sorts to just like whenever you can find a shorter proof of a thing please please contribute it um and is, so is, it, it, is it representable in the metamath language is the proof is the transformation from one proof to another representable in the metamath language mario yeah sorry uh, I, i'm not again? sure maybe you missed that i i was asking is the transformation from one proof to another representable in the MetaMath language? Uh, I would say no, for the most part. Uh, that is really, it is a meta MetaMath transformation, right? So that uh, when, once you're talking about the, the meta theory, when you're talking about a, pro a proof object is a meta mathematical thing. It's not something that's represented inside the theory. I mean, you could embed it inside the language. You could define a MetaMath verifier inside MetaMath, and then you'd have an actual concept of what a proof is. But for the most part, that's just a meta level uh, concept. Um, I think you need that. So I if you wanted you need, yeah. to, to, I mean, that's like the higher category theory approach. You know, you've got category theory, you need higher category theory. You need proof to proof transformations, proof to proof to proof transformations and so on, where you're where you're transforming between transformations between proofs and so on. I mean, that that, that should be representable. And I, I know, you know, again, that's- Well, it's, so that that's a, a, it's an operation that you can apply to a proof. Um, and uh, in this case, you know, it's it's something that, that is that is useful to apply and and you know I've I've actually written <laughs> I have actually written metamath proof transformations in Mathematica, uh, okay. so I mean it is it is a fairly you know it's, it's useful language for being able to express these these things without really worry you don't need it to be verified right it, that that's the interesting part about this is that you can write a proof transformation and it doesn't need to have any particular properties because you're just going to run it and then at the end you get a proof and you give it to the metamath verifier and if it checks and if it's shorter than the original then you've done a good thing um so that's that's sort of the the sense in which you don't really need these these meta level technologies to be uh to be wow we lost you again we're probably going to have to wrap up in a moment here but Formal, embedded in another oh. language oh the, we lost, uh, lost that, yeah. that um um but, but uh so, so I mean, just to, to zoom out again for, for, so I mean, you guys have now had, what is it, 20, well, Norm has had perhaps 25 years of experience in, yeah, in kind of that. seeing the mm -hmm. formalization of mathematics play mm -hmm. out. That's probably, so, so just in the history of these things, I mean, things like, like Mizar was kind of an older, that was Mizar an earlier generation or yes, was that? Yes, it was earlier than MetaMath. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's about 40 years, I think. Okay. And then, but but now Mizar sort of segued into this kind of formal mathematics journal and things like this, as I understand it, or, or what, I mean, and then, and then there was this QED project that didn't really take off. That was something related mm -hmm. to Mizar and so on. Yeah. And, um, and then the, uh, you know, the, the, the more recent generation of proof assistants, I think, have been very type theory uh, based, as, right. as I understand it. I mean, yeah. that, that um, mm -hmm. um, and, and what, um, uh, I mean, is that, are those the main lineages? I mean, is it, it's kind of like, like your sort of pure substitution structural, so to speak, which I like very much. I'm not a, I'm not a type theory enthusiast myself. I mean, al although mm -hmm. the, we could, we could have a long discussion about what, mm -hmm. about that, but, but, um, um, but it seems like the, uh, um, is, is that, I mean, in terms of sort of the architecture of you're thinking just about sort of the raw substitution, then there are the type theory based proof assistants. Is there another, is that sort of the history or so is there another? I, I, I would say that, that there's rough. <sighs> Please. 
speaking, their groups uh, uh, define the, the like the, the the major lineages. So so you have like Mizar and Metamath are both uh, based on ZFC, um, whereas uh, let's say Isabel, uh, HOL Light, uh, HOL Four. Uh, and a couple other proof power. These are all based on uh, the HOL higher order logic. Um, and then there are proof assistants like uh, Koch and Lean, which uh, use uh, dependent type theory as their foundations. Um, so the, the type theory based one, or the dependent type theory one in particular, um, tend to push a lot more computation into the verifier. So the verifier itself uh, has this definitional equality rule and it can do some very non-trivial computations. As a result, like you have these crazy results that like the, the asymptotic complexity of checking a, um, a, a, a lean proof term is astronomical. It's, it's the proof theory ordinal of dependent type theory, which is way above ZFC. It's, it's, it's crazy because, so, because basically you can write a Turing machine almost inside the, dependent type theory. What does it tell you about mathematics that all these different foundations all lead to mathematics as mathematicians practice it? What does that tell you? Well, it means that mathematic, mathematicians don't care about foundations, right? Uh, I mean, that but, mathematicians no, that have a certain you? idea of mathematics that isn't the foundations. They aren't right, thinking in I terms think of it, foundations. I think it tells you that there's, the question is, is there another general theory of mathematics? So Hilbert, in a sense had, and, and Whitehead and Russell and so on, had in some sense a general meta theory of mathematics. Mathematics mm -hmm. is something you start from axioms, you formally build it up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now what we're learning is it doesn't matter what axioms you start with. There's a whole bunch of different ones you could pick, but you still get the same emergent mathematical structure. So does that tell you that there's some different level at which you could describe this that isn't that same start from the atoms, so to speak, and build upwards, because it doesn't matter what the atoms have in them. Now, the reason why I'm interested in this is because in our model of physics, this is exactly what happens. That is, it doesn't matter much what the underlying rules are, you still get general relativity, you still get quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. There are these generic emergent facts that don't depend, just like in the statistical mechanics case, don't depend on the microscopic details. And so the big question to me is uh, what, you know, what is the emergent sort of, um, uh, you know, what is the emergent kind of, um, um, uh, you know, bulk theory of mathematics that does not depend on the axioms? Is there something you can say that is not the mere geography of mathematics, so to speak, that is not merely talking about the particular theorems people have chosen to prove and things, but is a is a more generic statement about uh, kind of um, um, uh, you know ab about these things, and that's that's the thing that I'm I'm curious about, and I'm I, I have a suspicion, okay, that there is such a thing, and I have a suspicion that we and, and kind of what I'm what I'm really curious about with respect to metamath and so on is using it as kind of experimental data to try and find that thing. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, um, you know, in other words, you, you've got a, um, um, you know, what is the generic, what is the analog of general relativity for metamathematics? And that's why I'm asking these questions about if proof, if the set of proof structures is time evolution, the, the instantaneous state is like the structure of space. And then, so what you can ask is, and, and by the way, you have things we already know you have things like black holes in metamathematics, which are essentially decidable theories where, where just the thing, you know, you worked out all the consequences, there's nothing more to say. That's so time ends. And um, so, you know, some things like that we understand. Um, look, we should, I, I keep on being told that I'm super late for, for several other things I was supposed to do here, but I'm having too much fun. So, so um, um, it, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm just sort of curious with, with Norm here, what, what um, 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 I don't quite know how to-, how to Well, let me just say, first yeah. of all, if you're looking for a commonality, uh, there is a list of a hundred theorems that have been proved in many, many different languages. Uh, and usually the proofs are available. 
Um, now that's, you know, so how did each of those languages arrive at that theorem is an interesting thing to contemplate, but uh, right. that's, are you aware of that by Freak? Yeah, that's Freak, uh, the Freak, what's his name? Freak. Yeah, Freak, it pronounced Freak, F-R-E-K, right. Anyway, okay. that's. The, yeah, uh -huh. right. Yes. No, I, I mean, you know, look, one of the things from a practical point of view about mathematics and the formalization of mathematics, you know, a few years ago, um, we organized a, a conference about formalization of mathematics, which unfortunately we didn't invite you to because I didn't know about metamath at that time, mm -hmm. which is my, my mistake. Um, the, uh, um, uh, but in any case, we invited a whole bunch of mathematicians and a whole bunch of, in a sense, meta mathematicians. Okay. The sad thing was a wonderful set of meta mathematicians showed up and almost no mathematicians showed up. <laughs> including friends of mine who I was like, you should have shown up to this thing because they just, as you've said, as, as you know, Maria said, um, you know, it, it's the mathematicians don't care about the foundations in many cases, but, but yeah, I, I think um, uh, that's an interesting suggestion to, I mean, you know, one thing is all those hundred theorems that probably proved with a bunch of different axioms underneath, mm -hmm. which is kind of really, you know, what would Hilbert think about that? Mm -hmm. That's pretty weird, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. how would how should you think about that in terms of Hilbert's program? I mean, it's it's like, you know, his idea was mathematics is what you get by here are some axioms, now go establish mathematics. It's not supposed to be the case that it just doesn't matter what the axioms are. But and, it's it's not that the axioms are sort of of god given or something like that, right? Like the the uh, the fact that there have to be axioms and rules of inference is just because uh, like there has to be something at the bottom. Like no matter how you explain the situation, you're always going to put something at the bottom. This is just sort of when you have layers, there has to be a lowest. Like that, that, that you That's can't avoid that. That's not correct argument for fluid mechanics. Uh, with fluid mechanics or with general relativity in our, in our uh -huh. models now, it actually doesn't matter what's underneath. In other words, the, the, the statement that general relativity works is an essentially piece of pure bureaucracy. That is, it doesn't matter what the, you know, it's pure infrastructure. It's a purely, it's, a, it's an emergent infrastructural result that doesn't depend on a lot of underlying details. And so the question is, to what extent is mathematics as practiced by mathematicians, an emergent infrastructural set of results? And to what extent does it actually depend what the sand is made from, so to speak? And but depends that the sand isn't inconsistent. That's definitely important. I Which, wonder. I mean, about in that. a sense, I... that's that's a very unusual property that that like somehow you know you go exploring somewhere and then some somewhere you find false and then suddenly the entire picture changes, right? I think it, that's a. I I suspect that you know the whole Tosky theory of truth thing is is sort of a misunderstanding. That's my guess. I think this this emphasis on the on the primacy of, I mean, I think your, you know, Norm's metamath thing is a story of substitution. It's not a story of truth and falsity. Mm -hmm. And truth and falsity, I claim, is an emergent property in mathematics, not the raw material. And in fact, the very fact that you're describing metamath as being pure substitution. Now, okay, you've got some extra stuff with these provisos that I don't understand so well. But I think that that tells you right there you know, in, in my new kind of science book, I analyzed a bit, um, you know, what does, what, what does it really mean to have, in addition to this purely structural multiway system, when you say, I'm going to color it like truth and falsity, what does that mean? And what kinds of things do you get? And I think that's a derived property. I don't think that's a fundamental property of mathematics. And, and I know that that's a, a, you know, people in thinking about mathematics from, from, you know, from Aristotle and Plato and, you know, and so on, on the concept of truth as opposed to structural. I mean, I would say there is a kind of structural way of developing mathematics that isn't about truth. It's about, can you derive this? Can you create this, you know, this symbolic expression basically? And, you know, is that symbolic expression emergible? And so in other words, in the physical universe, you could say the analog of truth is just this. Is there a structure? Can you make in the universe from the Big Bang, is there this weird configuration of matter that can be constructed? If the answer is yes, then it, it's there. If the answer is no, then it's not there. 
and you don't have this notion of, you know, the 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 predicate. It is true that is a derived thing. So I I don't think consistency is an important part of mathematics. Uh, well, so consistency is a syntactic property. Um, I I mean whether whether something is is sound. We lost you again. Um, so, is a semantic. Say that again. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. What? Okay. What, whether. Uh, so consistency is consistency is a syntactic property, but soundness is a semantic property. So soundness says that you only prove theorems that are true. Now, it, the word true has to appear in this statement. And uh, this is really talking about the relationship between the syntactic objects that you're manipulating and, you know, the real world or somehow we're connecting how we connect these things to. I would say that mathematics is fundamentally semantic. Um, like the, the informal mathematics is really about the way in which these syntactic manipulations that we're doing relate to the real world or the real platonic mathematics. I, I don't know how you want to how you want to cut that, but uh, that's certainly the way actual mathematicians think, right? So uh, I, I mean, I am personally take, take a sort of formalist approach to this, no surprise, uh, in the philosophical sense. Um, but, and, and, and in general, formal uh, math, uh, formal theorem provers will very much encourage a formalist approach where you say it's just a game of symbols. It's really a very syntactic thing that we're doing. We're checking that whether this thing is derivable from those axioms by applying these rules. And that there's no there's no real questions about whether things are true or false or anything like that. Um, but uh, as far as you know, the questions that you're asking about, like uh, the the geodesy, like how how does what actually develops? Th those are all very semantic concerns. People people are thinking about what these things mean, not just what they uh, how they're written. Um, and 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 oh, to some degree, you're just back forming. You're making things. You write them in a certain way because you want. Lost you again. The... We lost. We lost the punchline there again. I'm. Uh -huh. uh, you, you 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 need to the your your you need the semantics, and we write down. You have to write words. Those words are a syntactic object, uh, and mathematicians communicate using words. Uh, but what they're thinking about is the cement, the connection between those words and the truth. I think it will get us into too big a rabbit hole, but I think that the one of the ways to ground what you're saying is to think about physics. In physics, reality might be viewed as the meaning of physics. And the, you know, one of the things that's come out of our model of physics is that the, the texture of that model is unbelievably similar to the texture of metamathematics. In fact, it probably is the same thing. And so one of the things that I've sort of made an argument for is the, the concept that, you know, why does the universe exist? We can make an argument for that. But if we believe that argument, that argument implies that mathematics also exists in some very platonic sense. And this is a, this is a longer rabbit hole. It's a deeper rabbit hole than maybe we should go into here. But I'm, I'm you know, my view of, you know, the thing I'm particularly interested in with respect to this meta math and meta mathematics, is uh, trying to trying to use that as empirical raw material to understand the answer to this question about what is the um, uh, um, you know what is this thing that is not the Hilbert formalist mathematics, but is something that is a more realistic model of what it is that we humans are doing when we think we're doing mathematics. And that's, um, uh, and we should probably, should probably wrap here. And I, I um, um, this has been, has been very interesting for me at least. Uh, the, the, um, um, and uh, uh, Norm, I don't know if you want to make any, any comments about, I'm, I'm still very curious. I, I hopefully will get to actually meet in person one day because I think we, we live not far apart. Mm -hmm. so. Um, but uh, um, it's, um, uh, um, I am, I, I have to say, I'm quite curious about the personal question of, of sort of 
how how does this how does what you've done with metamath interact with with other things you've done in your life is this kind of a, its own separate meta corner or is this sort of deeply interwoven with with other things you've, you've thought about um it's pretty much separate from most other things in my life um i have done some work in physics where uh, some equations I came up with, I verified in MetaMath, but uh, I didn't even mention MetaMath in the paper. It's just that I use it as a tool because uh -huh. I wasn't confident that my proof on paper was correct because it was a complicated formula. Uh, other than that, um, really, it's, it's its own thing. It's sort of taken a life of its own. I'm, you know, been very amazed at what other people have contributed to it. It's just grown far beyond what I ever dreamed in terms of its scope and the number of impressive theorems that people have put into it. Um, you know, it's getting to the point where my own contribution is sort of minor stuff at the beginning, you know, building up a set theoretical foundation. Beyond that, it's like. That's great. So, right. Well, we should wrap here, but thank you both very much. And uh, um, good stuff. And uh, um, until another time. <laughs>